so I got LASIK. You, you are so sure. LA. No. I, you know what though? You. I just. This got is why I moved to San Diego. I, the, I can't I got, be. Part I got them of this from anymore. Amazon for like six dollars. It was just. It was just to see if I liked clear glasses, and then I got LASIK, so I didn't. Matter. So before, but this is the the funniest thing, especially now living in San Diego, where normal people live. Um, I was at Deus before coming here just to grab a quick uh, macchiato. <laughs> And uh, there's a dude, some of the th- people, some of the things people wear, especially in Venice, this guy walks up, he's in overalls, but like fancy white and black artistic, oh, like all, all over print overalls yeah. with a blue, bright blue sweater underneath. <laughs> and then this like corduroy brown hat. Mm-hmm. You know, we're live, right? Yeah. yeah. Do you want a hat? <laughs> You won't wear my. No, you won't wear no, the, I don't you want won't wear the minus hat. No, I don't want a hat. Okay, Maybe. but you know what I mean. It's like, it's just like, it's the the, the, the most ridiculous. No, well, it's, it's just it's just it's the look. It's the scene. Like these glasses. I can't. You're part of the scene. Listen, you don't see me wearing those when I go out. Why do I you have them? If, well, hold on. No, no. First of all, you. you why well, do? You, listen. If they, listen to me. <laughs> hold on. Listen. Hold on. Listen. If these are not for <laughs> going out. You don't, why did I get them? Why did I'll you get you. them? They're I'll not blue why. light lenses. I'll tell you why I got them. How do you know that? Because I know I have a pair, and they're not. And this is not blue light lenses. Reflecting them. Well, where, where's the blue light, Chris? Where's the blue light? Not blue light. Are they blue light? Can you even tell when you wear <laughs> blue light glasses? Yes, I can. How? <laughs> what? You think it's placebo? You're not getting any blue light. Literally, like you don't see any. I also, color there's blue. no more blue. That's false. <laughs> absurd. <laughs> that is absurd. So why'd you get them? I got them because I used to have the world's worst vision for a race car driver. And I wore glasses and contacts. When I started off-road racing, that was a shit show because there's so much dirt that goes through your helmet, into your eyes. You're just driving through dust farts every every second of your life as an off-road racer. And so you have to wear glasses, but they fog up if it's really hot. So I was trying out different stuff. So anyways, when I was wearing glasses... These are made in Shenzhen, China. Yeah, hopefully they have some coronavirus on them. (laughs) <laughs> be hoping for that but when i was wearing glasses yeah i was like you know what i like that kind of clear glasses look and so i wanted to try it out it's before i got look. some and then i got lasik and it didn't they look it on, they look it on you did not matter so anyways i rest my case there you go well we're back season two episode two yes we're going to uh continue or not yeah continue our indycar preview we felt like it was a little rushed yeah you know I felt like there's so many more storylines that we need to like dive into a little bit with any car preview. Some of the rookies, which we have a guest on for uh, this episode, remote, but we have a guest. Uh, one of the rookies that I think one of the surprise rookies of the 2020 season that caught a lot of people off guard. Not that he got an IndyCar ride, but maybe the IndyCar ride he got. Uh, Oliver Askew is going to be joining us here in a little bit. So it'll be good to catch up with him and see where his preseason training's at and and the transition from uh, the road to Indy into being finally a professional paid race car driver. So that'll be interesting. That'll be interesting. He's uh, It'll be great to talk to him about that and just get some perspective on like what it's like going from the whole the whole shebang of being a cart driver, no money, trying to figure out your path right. and talking to the right people, putting yourself out there, regardless of the negativity. I'd like to see, you know, what that's like and, and hear it really and as a driver coming from all sprint racing, technically, yeah. and all that's, that's what you do. Yeah. from carting through road to Indy to go into it. I mean, it's, you know, that's a two hour race yeah. in a high powered car with a lot of downforce. Yeah. So, um, and someone that came from very little money. Yes. You know, so uh, I think that's one of the coolest things about this story. So we'll dive into that. But, uh, you know, you're you're the one that that really wanted to revisit the IndyCar preview. Sure. So give me give me some topics. Let's, well, go. Here, Let's here, roll on this. We obviously touched on the, um, you know, the McLaren duo, um, obviously of Pato and Oliver. Yep. Um, so we can get into that. And there's a whole story with Pato, too. Yep. But. Another rookie coming in that we just totally blatantly for I mean not blatantly but like forgot <laughs> to say, talk about didn't blatantly no. leave someone out no we did not uh, Renus VK um, 
ask you, first of all, this is actually, and we, 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 it's something that maybe a lot of people don't know in the, the people that mainstream people, and these aren't the people that watch, listen to the podcast, but the mainstream people don't know is, uh, is it, by the way, you would know, is it Renus or Rhinus? It's Renus, right? Renus, Rhinus, potato, potato. Okay. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, I think it's Renus, but VK, VK is his n- last name, you know? It's yeah. Like, VK. So we'll just say VK. We'll call him VK. VK. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So VK and Oliver go way back. Yeah. From the carding days, arch rivals, arch rivals, all the way through uh, the Road to Indy program, both getting IndyCar rides on season. Kind of two different paths, too. Like VK, whether or not his family has money or not, he's always had massive backing behind him. Yes. Uh, like the Yumbo sponsorship that he's had on his car. They're big sponsor in sport, as it is. Uh, big sponsor in cycling and, and in sport in general. They've been with him for a while. He's got a lot of money behind him. He didn't get there because of his money. The kid's been talented since the beginning. Um, and he is going to be interesting because he's a little bit of a sleeper in the sense that we all know how good he is, but he never has hype around him. I know. It's, it's you don't hear his name a lot. You 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 see the results. Why you see that? the wins. I don't know. Maybe he just doesn't. I don't know him personally. I've interviewed uh-huh. him one or two times uh, back in the karting days. Uh Maybe his personality isn't as outgoing. Maybe it's because we're kind of more in the North American media and be because he's not American and there's an American coming up with him. It's kind of a little bit more focused yeah, on Askew. He, he's been kind of hyping that Ari Leyendijk relationship, right. you know, and that's kind of his roots. Yep. And obviously Ari, Ari Leyendijk was such a figure in IndyCar yep. is such and a Dutch. figure. And Dutch, so there's uh, there's that representation that's kind of in the hybrid. I think as a push to try to get him more mainstream in North America. And who's VK with? What team? Ed Carpenter. Oh, okay, so solid team. Solid team. Um, you know, I think less hype than what you would consider a McLaren to have. Right. You know, as you come into IndyCar, but nonetheless, McLaren SP. McLaren SP. We got to be legit. Come on. Okay. Say You're the right. name right. You're right. You're right. All right. All right. So uh, he comes in there with a guy that uh, had a lot of road to Indy experience and is now out of a ride, and that's Spencer Piggott. Oh, I didn't even realize that. Yeah. He didn't get re-signed. No. Damn. I haven't seen him post on Instagram. or I don't know. I don't know who's talking so, to Spencer. So right now we have Spencer's out of a ride, at least full-time. He'll probably get a 500 ride. Most likely. I think he will. Yeah. I hope he does. I'm a big fan of Spencer's. Um, know him since he was seven, eight years old and super talented driver. Um, kind of that same path Pato was on. They were rivals when they were that age. So that that's kind of cool to see that all these guys kind of that age moving up and, and making it. But and then we have Hinch, who has an Indy car, or has an Indy 500 ride so far, and that's it. But doesn't man, that's that's interesting. Yeah. So then the other side of it is Hinchcliffe. And with this kind of dynamic duo coming into McLaren SP, SP, then you got Hinchcliffe, a staple in IndyCar racing, is now out of a ride. You know, and he's a veteran. He has wins. Yep. I think we talked about it a little bit on the yep. last podcast. But now he's looking for a ride. And I was doing a little research. Apparently, he got a sponsor for the 500. Yes. Through... It went down in the DMs on Instagram. That's awesome. Yeah. And someone like they DM'd him about uh, you know, like, are you racing this year? And this was this was so what you what you've heard is this this is after he lost his ride. He lost his ride and looking for stuff. Someone, you know, hit him up and you know, he said, like, yeah, this is the Sitch. I don't really you know, he's kind of saying too, like, I don't really know what to say i've never been really in this position to have to like right you know like calculate what the numbers are right but it was like the person was just asking well, what does it take you know to like take care of this thing and uh you know he like got back to him told him <laughs> threw a number out there <laughs> yeah and s- before you know it within a month he's meeting with the chairman of this i think it's like an energy company like yeah, i think you're right yeah energy or, or or maybe data but i think they're what is it well we should know more on this topic it's not, where's a young jamie when we need him that can pull this important. up for us it's not necessarily important to the story but but 
it went down in the DMs to the point where that person was like, let me get in touch with the... Let me get on the horn. The, the CMO of this, this deal did, and he was a very prominent figure in the company, and he's got funding for the Indy 500, which if you don't know, I mean, that's going to cover what? What is a month of May in IndyCar? I've heard it's... I think I remember Connor telling me once that it's like, if you're a driver and you, you not like what the cost, but like a driver is expected, I think, to bring at least one and a half million dollars. Could be more than that. For the 500. Could be more than that. I know it's over a million, if I remember correctly. It's expensive. It blew me away. But I remember when I was told how much, yeah, I remember how much it co- to, I was told it cost to do the 24 hours of Daytona when Get I first got into sports car racing. And it literally is a budget almost for the full season. Almost in some of the categories. What do you mean? Like like the team expects, like they, the, they expect to, the cost to do it, why it's so expensive. Like I remember this was back in the, early 2000s, mid 2000s, I think to race like in the GT category. So like a Porsche GT3 cup car would have been like $60,000 a seat in each, all four drivers are bringing 60 K to do that. Okay. That's not what a season costs, but you know, it's, they, they essentially are riding off the car for the weekend because the amount of wear and tear on the car and the engine for 24 hours, that's the cost of it. It's a lot. A lot of money. I I've gotten emails. There's drivers that legitimately ma- that make over a hundred thousand dollars just racing in not no yeah. results, just just making it into the field, having a sponsor, they get paid a hundred thousand dollars to do the Indy five hundred. That I know for a fact. Right. That's crazy. Those That's are, awesome. Those are it's established cool. Established guys that no, because system. I think I think like a James Davison or someone like that is getting paid a hundred k. Okay. Because it's all part of the sponsorship. Well, let's deal. talk to James about that. And I don't I, have a contact to James anymore. So I feel like I can, I know someone that can, but I'd love to talk to James. He's got an interesting path. He does. He does the Indy 500, pops up here and there. He, do, he, the he does. He does. He all, competes sometimes. He does all the vintage, worldwide vintage stuff uh, in the, what is it called? It's called the Rolex masters or something masters uh, races vintage f1 cars he's all over the world traveling it's an interesting it's a cool interesting life as a like a uh i don't know why i'm having a blank here but a driver <laughs> that roams around the planet a world traveler no there's some other word i'm looking for but a jet setter something like jet setting that race car drivers. yeah yeah Jet setting race car drivers. Let's not cover that topic today. Okay. Uh, I'd rather not. Okay. <laughs> but uh, yes, we should get him on because yeah, he's got an interesting thing and and also the always evolving thing. Like what is there, you know? Yeah, that's always been interesting to it's, me too. How yeah. that came about and the yeah. connection of why it continues and and uh, yeah, that's a cool story. Is there something with um, wasn't always evolving in some way? They were they were like they so, knew Paul Walker really well, right? Yeah, so they were the car builder or one of the main car builders for the Fast and Furious franchise. I see. So they built the cars for the Fast and Furious franchise. Interesting. And that's where that connection to Paul Walker Jing. came from. Okay. So um well before we stray too far off topic, what were we back about? to <laughs> the IndyCar right. preview. Uh okay. So you talk about Ed Carpenter racing. Yeah. And then you had the Connor Daly. Yeah. Uh, but before we get off Renus, let's just say they ha- he had a Titanic battle with Oliver. You go back to the USF 2000 days. I remember I was in Pro Mazda when they were competing for the USF title uh, at Watkins Glen. It came down to the last race of the season. They were starting front row, one and two. Oliver, I think, was off pole and just had to like finish in the top five, you know, but that's a little intimidating. Right. Trying to finish in the top five in a really competitive field, and, and you got Renus. You can psych yourself out, man. That's one of those things they say, like as a lot of mistakes dr- racing drivers make are when they take their foot off the gas. Yes, yes. And it's like, I don't know, top five is enough where it's like you cannot do anything wrong. You right. lose a front wing, the, that race is over. Yep. You know, No mistakes. No mistakes. And uh, Oliver drove really great. I finished, I think he finished second or something, and won the championship. 
yep. you know, and then you go into the next year. Oliver, he raced with Cape in USF, so he's racing with Cape in Pro Mazda. And then Renus goes with Yunkos and kills it, slices through, gets a bunch of wins. It's the first year of the car. They had a testing advantage, I would yep. imagine, and they just lights out really, really quick. Whereas Oliver with Cape, they were a little, they were kind of struggling and yep. like, oddly off the pace but still there you know you see all yeah he was a third wins. third fourth a lot of the times but got yeah. some wins yep yeah and a guy like you got robert mcginnis in there that randomly is beating oliver's in some cases he was racing with yunkos too right. and kind of mixing it up but you know inconsistencies and so you you find oliver finishing third in the championship you know and and thinking like is it another year in indie pro or is he moving on? And and then I remember over the offseason it came out, he was racing Andretti Indy Lights. And so these guys have now swapped championships. But Renus has the momentum at this point. Right. Big time. Right. He just wins the Pro Maz. That's more important than the USF one. And, he, you know, technically it's like, does he need the scholarship money? We don't know. But he has it on top of all the fun. It's like he's going to go do work just in Indy Lights. Just testing on test. testing on testing. Yes. And... And then Oliver, you know the situation, and it's right. like the money's not really there. How is he even going to you know, get into the car and get some feel for it? But gets into the Andretti Indy Lights program, whereas Renus, since he wins the championship with Yunkos, signs with Yunkos and Indy Lights. Yep. And there's kind of that, that battle then ensues in Indy Lights, and it's, not even, it's really not even close until halfway through the season when Renus starts getting a hold of things. And, you know, at the end, wins races at Laguna, yeah. like sweeps the weekend, was fast the yeah. whole time. Um, and, he, you know, he won races elsewhere, too. But it's been very, very close. So he finishes second in points, I believe. And they, they keep swapping every time. And so it'd think, be interesting to see. Do you think he's coming in with a chip on his shoulder? <laughs> Absolutely. A little bit? Absolutely. He probably doesn't have the hype uh, around him. You know, obviously, I could see know. him. He's. I could see him not wanting the hype, though. He's Dutch. You know, I could see him maybe not wanting that hype. Not saying he didn't want a big ride and didn't. You know, probably is like, wait, why am I not being picked for the yeah. McLaren program? Blah yeah. blah blah. But he may not care for the hype. He may be that. And like I said, I don't know him well enough. I'd love to be able to talk with him and and see if he's just that guy that likes to wants to do work, lives under the radar. And just gets results and is a hard worker. Yeah, because I know he is a hard worker. I remember that from back uh, when he was in karting that he he works hard, yeah. works hard at the craft. So that's he, interesting. I can see him being really quick, really fast. Yeah, he. It seems like that's been the case in his career. Outlaps. He's just banshee out of hell, yeah. and he's always on the pace, and yeah. he's always pushing the limit. And when you got when you got talent and money. Usually that helps. That with is that. a really good do. That's a good combo. Yeah. So I I would say even if you know maybe for whatever reason things don't don't gel well at Ed Carpenter or it's maybe not the season he desires, I would still look for him in the years to come. Right. He's going to be in a good IndyCar ride. Yes. And he's going to be getting results. Yeah. So I think it's it's kind of from Oliver's point of view too. It's like knowing that's going to be a battle that will probably potentially in a couple of years championship end up battles being the championship battles yeah because you gotta think looking at you know canon just announced that he's in his last year this is gonna be his last year um which is to talk about an amazing story and career for that dude um i think it's time i think his speed is still there, but I think mm -hmm. the ride that c is capable of getting him day in and day out results just isn't there. Yeah. Um, but you look, man, Dixon, how many more years is he going to have left? A uh, Bourdais, these guys. So that, where's Bourdais? Uh, he has I, not signed. No, I don't think he's going to. No. And so you got Ferrucci that re signed at Coin, which is. Did he? Yes. That he was did. announced a few days ago or a week ago. Um, super surprising. Uh, yeah, Ferrucci, I'm just really Santino Ferrucci. I'm just really surprised on that. Which one, the re-signing or him? I'm really, I'm not surprised he has an Indy car ride. I'm surprised he has an Indy car ride over some other guys that don't. I'll put it that way. <laughs> like a, like a Bordet, like a Hinch. I'm surprised. I think that we'll see. He's got money to bring. 
I know. And Bourdais does not. Yeah. Which is an unfortunate sign of the times. Yeah. You know? How old is uh, Castro Neves has to be out soon? He is out. Oh, he's out, out. Well, like, maybe oh, yeah. an odd 500, but... That's right. Yeah. Duh. Old news. I'm Here, sorry. Buddy. But... You can see how disconnected <laughs> I am. <laughs> but you're not. Like that's I'm just, not. It's just, I think... He's around the Penske program and DPI, so yeah. I'll give it to you. Will Powell? But, how old's Will Power? Uh, hmm. I think late 30s. Okay. I think Will is the type of guy that's going to go on and on and on <laughs> yeah. because he's he's got... the How many tiles does he have? One or two? I think one. I, I think he, he's been... Uh, two. Talk about a guy. He's always that so is quick. so talented, so quick, and just the odd ball. Bad. I'll put. I'll put it as bad luck because I don't think he puts himself in these situations. Just bad luck. I think his, the, the, I, I can remember at least two titles that he, he's lost by just stupid bad luck DNF, or like being involved in something else that he had n n no part of being in. Yeah. Incident wise, yeah. that just took him out. Yeah, you know, I think it's sometimes his his uh, reaction or his, his, the way that he tries to deal with this, like, I don't know, inherent bad luck, I think is what what separates him from a new garden in some ways, where new garden is just dead on dead balls consistent, whereas power, my God, in qualifying, he's a hero. He is a he outright power? outright pace willpower every time is man. He just has another gear. Yeah, something lights out. He gets into this like just place that he, I mean I I remember seeing him at Sonoma in like 2012. What the speed? I'm gonna pull up. Keep the, going. I'm gonna the, pull up some IndyCar stuff. The here. speed that he would carry through the carousel on on reds and then through the chicane. Uh, he I mean. It seemed like at least five or six mile an hour quicker, you know, on reds. He just got it. Yeah. He just got it and made the car work. He's an incredible talent in qualifying. In race trim, there's something to me that just falls apart. It's weird. And he has the pace, but right. it's like that consistency. He'll like always, 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 always. Willpower will jump out to an early lead. How you know be handily in the lead, right? And then after pit stop cycle through, he'll get in some shit with someone that's running on old tires, and he's got to make a move, and he makes a, a bonehead pass, yep. gets tied up, spins out, and it's like all of a sudden, what happened? He had a 13 second lead dissolved into now he's in fifth place. Yeah, you know, or he's fighting for tenth, and that's where he and it's like, man, I want him to win, but it's it's a struggle, but. I think he will always be there because that pace is always there. Well, I think he's, as you've seen him, his, he's, he's fiery, man. Mm -hmm. And I think until he gets another, at least another, I think he'll, he's going to be that guy kind of like Dixon, Kanan, that are staying in for the long haul. And But I think it's for a reason. And it's, it's to try to win another title with everyone, of course, right? But I think I have a feeling without knowing, but I have a feeling looking at, as a person that's super competitive that he's like, I need another, I need another title. I've yeah. been so close so many times. I need this other title. And sure. I think he's going to get it. He, he, he's incredible. So I went to the IndyCar site and, uh, another piece of news that we didn't touch on last time because it wasn't news yet. Uh, Charlie Kimball, I was going to say Charlie Kimball. full time ride again. Another okay. driver that I'm also Derek very coin or is I, AJ Foyt Foyt Foyt. I'm also very surprised that he uh, has a full-time ride compared to a couple other guys. <laughs> sure, sure. I, I'm surprised. surprised. So uh, we'll, do you want to just leave it at that? I don't know where that's headed. I just feel like 2020 is a new year, and I want to be positive. Yeah. I want, I want to keep positivity in there. You know, he's had pace at ovals, um, yeah. and that's been there. One at Mid Ohio, but in a very stout program. Yep. Sometimes underperformed. Most times. Most times underperformed. Almost, but not quite. So, then it, kind of at a Carlin program that was just hazy. Yeah, that's that was difficult for sure. Just kind of that hazy. was a different difficult program. Yeah. I bet. Yeah. So I don't know. 
it, in, in look, the prospect of AJ Foyt racing at this point, it seems like every year they're making wholesale changes to their program and nothing changes. I, go backwards. I, last year I had a little bit of an inside contact. What's going on? What's going on there. And it's a mess. It's a mess. Absolute mess. Really? You could, you would not imagine that that is, uh, that is a, a two car big time IndyCar IndyCar program with a major sponsor. Okay. You would be surprised. I was blown away. Is it engineering? It's, yeah, I mean it's it's I think it's everything. Management. I think it's it's everything. I just I, I just was surprised. I was really surprised. It not that you expect it to be as buttoned up as a Ganassi or but maybe a, just lack of infrastructure. It's a lack of that's the best way to put it. Lack lack of infrastructure. Yeah. I don't think whether or not it's how much control AJ has. And, you know, sometimes just like we talk about in coaching, just because you were an amazing IndyCar or amazing driver yeah. doesn't mean you're going to be a great manager know, of people. You're going to be a great manager of, uh, I mean, the best way to put it, a manager of people or, or you know how to hire the right people to take over. It's like NFL teams, right? With like the Raiders is yeah. a great example. The Raiders will never be successful because of the ownership. 100%. Yeah. There's a reason why the Patriots have been as successful as they are because Roger Kraft or Robert Kraft kind of goes, it's your team. Yeah, I'm going to give my input when I really need to, but Belichick, it's your team. It's your program. Build this for me. Yeah. Um, and I think in, like a, in a Foyt-type situation, it could be that. I don't know that specifically, but I do know, yeah, yeah you could you, say it's infrastructure. It's it's that kind of, um, you're running a corporation at that point, right. and it's maybe that person shouldn't be the head guy. It's a business. Or someone else is the head guy, but is always afraid of the head guy, yeah. the real guy that has the name on the door. It's hard because you have that it's history. Hard. You have that Indianapolis rich history. So it's like legend. how can you question legend. a legend of the sport? Yes. India, of course. And that's what the sport is built out of. How right. can you question a guy like that? that. Yep. Yet IndyCar today is a business. It's a full-time operation. Right. And I think the credentials to run that doesn't necessarily mean that you have to win a 500 to be ready to manage a team. You just have to know to put the right people in place under you. Joe Gibbs, NASCAR. There you go. Coach. I mean, that is if that's, if that's not a perfect example. You never raced. That, if that is not a perfect example of what it takes or the type of mindset and mentality to run a program of that size. Right. And obviously his son is, is heavily involved now, but I would not be surprised yeah. if you took some of the biggest GMs and head coaches success wise in other major sports and plop them into racing. Well, let's try to, do and it. I would say that because, let's try and this is some... why it's different. This is why it's different. The reason why it's different is because you're not having to come up with schemes necessarily, right? If you're a head coach in football, yes, you still have an offensive coordinator. Yes, you have a defensive coordinator. Yes, you may not be the play caller anymore. Mm -hmm. But in the end, you're still coming up with, you're still managing and, and you have to understand the game, sure. right? You can be an owner in motorsports. I guess it's no different than football, but I think you I think there needs to be a better understanding. I think in motorsports, I don't think it's you, as evolved yet. You know you structure. you if you know how to hire the right people, you know how to manage people, you know how to motivate people, you know how to give responsibility and ownership of that responsibility to someone. Uh just like they just dude, like I, Belichick says, do your job. Dude, I think I, I bet it, I bet you could. It's a good point. I think that most teams outside of top levels of motorsport like Formula One, most teams. I mean, you get, there's some IndyCar teams that have good infrastructure and they kind of see it that way. Most teams below that, though, do not. It's most of the time a team owner with the money to, to back it, but they would never be like a, an owner of an NFL football team. Right. Right? There's not that structure in place and, and not the knowledge and know-how as to how to structure it. And, and like that infrastructure is so important and giving delegating leadership in different ways and making sure you have the right staff, the right engineering, marketing, everything. Yep. 
buttons into it. That is not the case in like a pro Mazda team. And you got to think about it is important because got drivers are spending $750,000 right. a year to race in this program that is mismanaged question mark. Right. Right. I mean, uh, I think it just, those teams struggle with the ability to do that. And it's unfortunate because there's a lot of money being spent. A lot of guys that want to make it to pros and without that right infrastructure, I mean, you could get on a team that just isn't, it's not going to work out. You know? Yeah, there's a lot of teams out there that have the glitz and glam and, and look the part, and then you get in the program, and it's a shit show. Yeah. Um, because that's the easiest part, right? That's the easiest part. The easiest part is the glitz and the glam and the, the fancy trailer it's and awning and the team shirts and the, the sticker kit or sure. you know the graphics on the car. That's the easy part. Yeah. The hard part is the rest. Yeah. Um, no, man, yeah, that's a good point. So It would be cool to get... GMs from different sports like football or and baseball. head coaches because there's some head coaches, that, head coaches that can be great GMs and there's some great GMs that can't be head. You know what I right, mean? Right. You can't. There's not necessarily you can do both. Yeah. I think there are like a Belichick is is an would be an amazing GM and as a GM essentially. Let's right? approach him about starting a race team. <laughs> okay, cool. Do you know how to get in contact with him? No, I don't. But. Maybe just one day someone will hear this. Drop in the DM, just like you said. Yeah. Just drop him a DM. I don't see even if know he... if he's on Instagram, right? Like, no. I don't, I don't think he... Insta... He'd probably call it like Insta Face or something. Yeah, like he doesn't care about No, that. he doesn't care. He doesn't care about cell phones, I would imagine. <laughs> but, you know, like... Still got a BlackBerry. Yeah, like he just like doesn't know how to work it. I mean, that would be cool though. And And Joe Gibbs is a great example of someone that has like been so instrumental yes in the sport and like his program goes everywhere now it's in motocross you know it's like he doesn't have to know about motocross no. you know he no. just has to know how to do this thing right and, and he I, and i know he didn't have a huge involvement in uh motocross i know his son mm. was the one that was really spearheading that program interesting um but it's his name right i mean it is it's not it's also his son's name but it's it's his Empire. Is it you're talking about Ty Gibbs? Yeah. I think He's, Ty I think Ty Gibbs was the one doing the super cross motocross stuff. Is he? I think so. Okay. Um, but yeah. So no, it it's so that, that's definitely interesting. Going back to Foyt, yeah. I I from what I read, from what I gathered, it sounds like they're doing they got some engineers coming over from Andretti and like different programs. And Kimball, you know, here's the thing about him. He got into a Ganassi program. He was in an Andretti program. He knows that, you know, maybe, maybe like the outright pace, there's still, but he can there's help. still more to come. He but, can, but what about Kanan? But Kanan was there. Why are you telling me Kanan couldn't have done the same thing? No, no, no. What I'm saying though is what I'm I'm, I'm not saying, no, I'm not saying Kim, Kimball's developing that. Okay. What I'm saying is that Kimball follows the infrastructure. Yes. Like he's one and he saw maybe some potential in Carlin knowing what they can do, what they have done. Carlin's like a great example of like, you know what? That's a program I would trust, the infrastructure-wise, racing-wise, uh, and obviously Andretti Ganassi as well. So maybe he sees something that we don't. future with Foyt that we don't see yet, and it's happening over the off-season, and the right type of staff members with the Could right be. amount of money Could be. Are, are welcomed over there, and, and maybe there's something we don't see yet. Because so, you saw back when Sato was part of the program. Yeah. Right? Yeah. It had some killer results. Yeah. On oval and road courses. They were there. It was so, just so it was there. consistent. See if it comes back. It'd be interesting to see. So, I mean, lastly, because we talked about the other guys in the in the first or mm -hmm. the last mm -hmm. podcast, you yeah. know, McLaren SP, um, first year, obviously, it's still uh, Sam Schmidt, Peterson Racing, um, really running and managing the program, but um, McLaren's infrastructure, money, technology coming in, whether or not they'll take a bigger control will be pretty interesting. But like we said at the beginning, we got one of the two drivers uh, that's going to join us. So we'll get him called in right now yeah. and get Oliver on the horn and uh, have, have a chance to really hear from one of the drivers themselves. It's a uh, a uh, a rookie that I think is going to turn a lot of heads this year. Won a lot of championships, really successful in karting. 
and good guy to talk to. So we're excited to have him on. So here we go. Oliver, uh, here he is. Yo, I didn't know I was going to be on camera. Yeah. <laughs> I would have shaved. Yeah, right. You're just trying to look older to make sure people know you're of age to drive an IndyCar. Grow the stash. Yeah. I can, dude. It's then this d- is like a day. You got to do it. Then. <laughs> you got to do it. What's going on, guys? Not much. How you doing? Thanks for uh, thanks thanks for taking the time to yeah. chat with us. Thanks for joining us. No worries. I'm a fan. Uh, I know. I love, I love these podcasts. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. I know. Uh, yesterday you were quite busy. We were talking about that a little bit. Um, so you know, this is your first year being a true professional racing driver, not uh, like all the other road to Indy drivers that call themselves professionals and they yeah. pay uh, lots of money to race, but you're truly a professional now. That's one, one that's got to be super exciting, man, right? Yeah. Yeah. I'm, I'm, this is essentially my first job, right? Yeah. So have you um, never, have you never had a, a job before? Did you, have you ever had a W2 or W9 before? <laughs> I have, um, but it was, it was very part-time. Right. So, um, this like is your- driver coaching stuff like that, but um, it always has had something to do with racing. This um, is your first time having an actual boss. Yes, correct. So is wow. your is your is your like main? Obviously, the head person is Zach, but is that kind of your the person that you really report to on the IndyCar side, or who who's your like your boss? Zach and Sam. Okay. Um, I think more so Sam. I don't know how that. Uh, that McLaren partnership looks like in writing, but I, I know they're a, they're a, a technical partner of ours. Um, Sam still owns the team, both right. Sam and, uh, and Rick Peterson. So um, right now I report to, to Taylor Kyle, who is the, the team manager at uh, our McLaren SB. So I'm, I'm, I'm probably closest with him as far as um, those things go. Um, but yeah, to answer your question, it's, it's really exciting for, for both Pato and myself to, to be an indie car full time, um, you know it's it's very rare for the indie lights rookie to go into indie car with a full season already already taken taken care of. So um, excited for the opportunity and just can't can't wait to get started. In a couple of weeks, we're going to be in Coda testing. So yeah, um, that's when we can all the cars and all the teams are going to be there. So that, that's the first time I'll be able to you know really see where I where I stand. So. I mean, it must be a bit surreal, right? Like you come out of the road to Indy, your whole life you've been working for something that now all of a sudden a new team in IndyCar that has been, you know, a Formula One team with a rich history is now, you know, trying to take a crack at IndyCar. And as a driver coming into it, you and Pato Award, who's another guy who's young and, you know, has a lot of speed, just being able to like, indulge in IndyCar for the first time with a team like that, that's got to be amazing, right? It's huge. And, you know, the resources that we have, I think it's, it's a perfect environment for me to excel. So it's, um, you know, we, we have awesome driver coaches. We have Robert Wickens, um, who is, who is a mentor to us that will be with us for, for most of the race week, weekends this year and, and testing events. So, um, you know, from, from simulators to you know, data and video and, and just people around the team that have had, that have so much experience in the sport. Um, it's just a perfect place for both of us to grow and, and, uh, you know, really, really make a, make a stamp in, in this, in this series and hopefully be here for a long time. That's cool. Yeah. So, so you, you mentioned the simulator and what, so what does a day look like right now during the off season as you start to prep? Is it a lot of time on the simulator? And I know maybe some things you can't talk about, but like a day on the simulator, is that you going through and working through setups? Is it you just getting comfortable with some, you know, just to spending as much time as you can getting comfortable with some of the feelings of the car? Um, Because obviously I'm sure the simulator that you guys have is uh, pretty top notch. Yeah, I can talk a little bit about it. Um, It's the, it's the Chevy simulator in in Huntersville, North Carolina. Um, it's it's actually not that far away from what I experienced at the McLaren simulator, um, their F1 simulator. So it's um, that's really good for us. You know, um, it's probably one of the best simulators we have here in the states. So it's it's a huge, it's a great tool for us to use, especially for for a rookie like myself to kind of 
be able to hit the ground running when we go to these events. Um, I think the track models are really, 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 really close. So they did a really good job, um, you know, scanning the tracks and, you know, the, all the bumps and curbs are almost identical. Really? Wow. Um, and a typical day at the sim, it, it depends on what we're trying to accomplish. Um, we've done a lot of correlation from my one test that we did in Sebring. So just making sure that, uh, that the car in the sim feels as close to, uh, and the tire model feels as close to what it does in real life. So that when we, when we move on to other tracks, you know, we can, right. We can be that much better, um, when we're running the sim. So, how um, I also, uh, just to jump in, I was going to say like, how challenging is it to like try to simulate the tire model and how much do you have to work to get that close? Luckily for us, I think we've started, um, already with it pretty close. I don't know if, uh, I'm sure Penske has done a, a lot of testing on that sim. I think maybe, maybe uh, you know they've they've brought us up to speed a bit quicker gotcha. uh, because Chevy is very open with all their teams. You know they they are um, they do a really good job in trying to make sure that you know as a group and and as a uh, you know as a Chevy partner and you know we run their engines. We're all um, towards the front end of the grid or have the best chance of being in, towards the front end of the grid. So. Um, they're not very secretive when it comes to those uh, different aspects, but so is um, that not bro? Sorry, Oliver. So is thanks. that part of the program with at least with the Chevy simulator? Is that because it's their kind of their technology, their simulator that the teams that use Chevy and go in and use that simulator that it's kind of a uh, obviously there's some stuff that's going to be proprietary setup wise and everything, but sure. if you're able to help develop the simulator, that's something that's just going to be used for any team that comes in to use the simulator setup wise it's um that's not shared right but i think i think the tire models are, are already very close because the because the, the sim there has been run for a very long time right. so yeah um I, I think that's that's one aspect that's been that's been shared through through the teams and um we have a really smart group of people um both both from chevy and and from my team that go there every time we run the sim it's probably uh, it's about eight or nine of them okay. of engineers every time we run the sim. So, um, about how many, about how many hours do you put in, in a day on the simulator? Like a, like a, a, a good day, a good day's work. When I'm there by myself, I'll run from, from 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. Dang. So I'll, have, I'll have about an hour of lunch. So, so uh, are, but are you doing like full race sims? Are you doing yeah, different um, tracks? I did, race, I did a race sim yesterday. Um, that was that was at Coda, which was uh, which I think went really well. Um, obviously, there's a bunch of different uh, bunch of different things I need to learn that that go on during an IndyCar race, like you know, fuel save. Right. Um, that's what you know, pit stops, in and out laps, and and for me, I've asked to kind of put in, uh, to emphasize those those. Uh, you know, different things that, that I've, that are going to come up here and in, in the IndyCar races so that I can practice them as much as I can, um, on the simulator. So now sure. one thing I know that Scott Dixon, who kind of, I think most people can classify him as maybe the goat in IndyCar. Now he's, he's getting yeah. up there. One yeah. of the things everyone says that separates him from not only is his work ethic and I know you, uh, doing some stuff with pit fit in the past, you know, you, you've witnessed his work ethic, but, is his ability to lift and coast and still be able to turn lap times that are capable of winning races is a talent like no other, in my opinion. Yeah. Is that something that I think it's been talked about enough? Is that something that you, you are really trying to work on? Because that's a, it's a big difference, right? Coming from the sure. sprint racing in the road to Indy and not having to worry about that, not having to worry so much about pit stops that this is a whole new area of driving technique that you really never had to practice. Right. Really? No, you're, you're, you're right. Um, we don't really have any of that in the road to India. I mean, with the Cooper tire, uh, it's, it's a very good tire, but it's also much harder than the Firestone. You pretty much go flat out in Indy lights, you know, for the whole 30 or 45 minutes, however long the race is. So, right. um, I actually really enjoy these, these different challenges that, that are going to come up here and, and for this new season. Um, speed almost comes secondary in IndyCar. 
obviously it helps in, in qualifying. Qualifying is extremely important, but in the race, um, you've seen it time and time again. You know, the drivers that can fuel save and go fast at the same time are going to, you know, end up, you know, top five in the championship. So um, it's, I think, something that um, that I've that I've gotten quite good at on the sim at least. So we'll see how how that transfers to real life. Now you've uh, also been able to test the arrow screen, uh, arrow screen already. How is that? Is it is it much different feeling having that, or is it kind of once you get used to it, you're looking far enough down the road that it it's really no different? Well, I've driven closed cockpit cars before, so I've I've experienced that like that no wind sensation. Yeah, um, it's it's much quieter inside the car, and it you you hear different things that you haven't heard before in an open wheel car. Um, you you sense sense like uh, you know the noise of the engine more and even even uh, tire noise you, you can hear more of that that you haven't before so um, honestly when I when I drove it for the first time in Sebring I didn't comment on it all day like it was we just started and it was just part of part of the program so yeah. it wasn't hmm. wasn't uh, a talking point at all which um, which is awesome hats off to to IndyCar and and the partners that, that helped uh, that program I know. Um, heat might be a bit of an issue on that day when I drove the car in Sebring. It was about uh, it's about 82 degrees, and I think once it gets above 85, 87, it starts to get pretty hot in the car, especially when you're behind right. um, other other cars and in, in dirty air or at a slow track like St. Pete. You know, I, I expect it to be um, super hot. So, yeah. So from I guess like the driving side, you know, in the road in the road to Indy, it's mostly all sprint racing, right? So what do you think going into IndyCar? I mean, you you touched on it a little bit, but like, what do you think are kind of like the big kind of jumps that you may have to make or maybe may not uh, as a driver going from Indy Lights to then IndyCar where, you know, it could be two pit stops, three pit stops, Mm -hmm. um, you know, fuel saving from maybe a physical standpoint or even just a skill set. Is it kind of same stuff? You just apply it in different ways or is there another level that you think that you kind of have to work on as you get, as you kind of grow going into the IndyCar series? Yeah, it's the learning curve is going to be very steep, especially because we don't, I don't get that much seat time at all really before St. Pete. So, um, I think that's something that we're, that we've all struggled with as, as rookies, um, going into the IndyCar series, we don't get as much seat time as, as drivers have in the past. So I think that's where the simulation becomes very important. Um, but I, I think I'm going to have to make a, a pretty, pretty big jump from, from what I've learned in the past, um, you know, in and out laps and, and being able to go quick on, on cold tires is extremely important. And I think that's what Joseph Newgarden really excels at. Um, that's, he's won many races by just being a couple tenths quicker than the other guy on the out lap and right. just, and, and, um, and, and jumping, jumping the other guys on, on the pit sequence. So. Um, yeah, it's, it's not just about going flat out every lap now, you know, you're driving becomes subconscious, you know, and you're going to have to think about the game of the race. Right. Yeah. And I think that's where I'm going to, I'm going to have to, um, make a jump in, in, in my driving. So no, that's important. And I, you know, mm-hmm. we've known each other since, man, maybe since you've been, 12, 13 years old, just uh, as you enter junior competition. And I think that's always been one of your your strong suits as a driver. I think, you know, we used to joke I, kind of right when you first got into seniors, you, you know, I always teach and I don't teach as much anymore, but a lot of people always teach, you know, don't, in a cart at least, don't look back, right? It's going to distract you. But one of the things we talked about back then was you did it every single lap. You'd look back in the same spot, like it, like it was a religion to you. And you said, I use it as information. It doesn't distract me. It just tells me whether or not the pace I'm doing is correct or if I need to try to push more and whatnot. Do you find that that kind of mental strength that you've had from an early age is going to give you that kind of leg up as a rookie or... Is it still, are you still going in like, okay, man, this is going to be a daunting task. And, and the second kind of question to that is, you know, what are your, you know, main goals for, for the season? You know, obviously you want to win, but I think, you know, as a, as a, 
a smart kid, you have realistic goals and expectations for your season. So I'd love to hear that. Yeah. So I'll, I'll answer the, the first question. Um, obviously in the back of my head there, there is a, I wouldn't say a worry, but I understand how hard it's going to be. You know, it, this is, this is going to be the hardest challenge I've ever had in my racing career, which is, which is natural. That's just what comes with, with IndyCar racing these days. It's the most competitive series in the world. And, but I think over the past couple of years, I've never been like, I've, I've commented on this before in, in other interviews, like I've never been so calm. I think it's, it's just something that's come with, um, you know, being a racer for, for over 15 years now, you know, I'm just, I just feel so comfortable in the car and I don't get really so nervous before races anymore. And I think that also comes with preparation as well. And I'm, I, I emphasize my preparation. I think that's what builds confidence and, um, and turns into, and has turned into results over the past couple of years. Um, but what was, what was the second question again? Yeah. Just what, you know, what are your goals and expectations yeah. for the year? And, and do you have any expectations? Honestly, not right now. Um, I think, I think rookie of the year is, is a realistic target at the moment. Um, you know, as, as a rookie, going into the series, this is, again, this is only my fourth year in, in car racing now. I don't think a lot of people realize that, but I have, I haven't raced for a long time. It's crazy to think. Year, yeah, it really is. Fourth year in open wheel racing gone from, from carts to, to Indy car in four years. <laughs> yeah. So, um, right now as before I understand where our pace is at and, and, you know, which areas that I can, that I really need to focus on to be a better driver in Indy car. Um, Right now, it's just all about preparation and, and, and getting ready for that moment. So, Now, you you don't come from a big budget family. Um, you've worked really hard at it. You've, you, you have a great personality. You've got, been able to have some great connections that have helped you move up. And obviously, your talent is number one, um, starting with the scholarship that got you into Formula Car Racing in the beginning. What's kind of, Do you have any advice? Because we talk a lot about the younger kids in racing on the podcast. Do you have any advice to a kid that maybe has a little bit of budget or, and, you know, their dad is, you know, involved in helping them, but, you know, can't really drive the thing and it's up to the kid because the dad's working. You know, the kid yeah. has to really make moves at a 15, 16, 17 years old, you know, has to act like a 24 year old fresh out of college looking for a yeah. job, essentially. Do right. you have any advice to those kids that, uh, hey, look, I can do it. You know, what do you what do yeah. you say to them? Yeah, I think, uh, unfortunately, open wheel racing and car racing over the past couple of years has, has seemed to be very separated from the karting scene. And early on, before I even stepped foot in a car, um, I really didn't, I didn't understand how to put my name in that industry. You know, I mean, JF Thorman at Andretti Autosport used to tell me that he, you know, he was following my results and, and, and karting and, um, you know, they, they knew my name early on, but it's those results in the end, um, they're going to help your confidence as a racer and, and, you know, you'll be able to build your resume, but that's not what, what's going to set you apart from, from these other drivers that are trying to make it into the, into the car racing or open, open wheel racing industry. It's, um, it's going to these races and, 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 putting your face in front of these team owners and, and sponsors and companies that are, that are involved and making yourself known that you want, you want to be there. You'll do anything to be there making the phone calls. Yep. You know, that, that was my big step into the car racing scene is calling Jeremy Shaw uh, back in 2014 and 2015. Jeremy, Jeremy uh, runs the, the team USA scholarship and um, he has a, a bunch of different contacts in, in the indie car and sports car racing paddocks. And, um, I just, you know, called, called him up one day. Someone, uh, a good friend of mine told me that told me it'd, it'd be a good idea to call him and, um, you know, told him what I, what I, what I wanted to do. And, um, you know, eventually he, he invited me to the team USA shootout. So I think it's very important for these younger drivers to, to, you know, write the emails and, and make the phone calls and, and go to these races and, um, you know, set yourself, find a way to set yourself apart from the crowd. I think yep. that's really important. No, um, that's great advice. And yeah. it's true. I mean, I, I 
trying to remember the person it is, but it's some. It's I think it was Villapoto in motocross or someone that kept bugging um, Mitch Payton, being like, "I'm gonna ride for you one day." <laughs> like as an name, like I'm gonna ride. I need to be on Team Green. I'm gonna ride. I'm gonna ride. Like look at me. And he finally gave him a shot. Be plainly simple. Yes, he was talented, but plainly simple be, uh, over other people because he knew. It was. This is his life. This is. He wants it that bad. He's gonna. He's willing to put in the hard work. It's not someone that. Oh, I want it, and yeah, yeah. I'll try to. You sure. know, I'll do whatever I can. But no, it's someone that eats, sleeps, and it's kind of like the old attitude of, yeah. you know, sleep sleeping on the team's floor, and you know, asking a team, yeah. hey, what what can I do? I'll sweep the floors mm -hmm. for you. Um, mm -hmm. There's a a good story that a lot of people don't know about Raikkonen, where when he first got into Formula One. He'd buy buy the crew some beers, and he would just yeah. sleep in the Sauber garage mm -hmm. shop and just help the guys out and just be a part of the team. And you know, mm -hmm. and you don't see that side, right? But and and I think we don't see that side with a lot of drivers. But that is one of the kind of hidden secrets um, of the top top guys is is it's it's their life. Sure. Mm -hmm. What do you what do you think is like? Why do you think karting is kind of like disconnected from the car world or the formula car world or what is that disconnect? I, I'm not sure. Um, I, I just look at them as two separate industries, you know, and, and car racing, you know, you have, you have IMSA, IndyCar, um, you know, these, these other, in these other, you know, the road to Indy and the sports car racing industries, they, you, I look at it as one, you know, drivers go from, from team to team and they run the 24 sure. they race Indy car, but you know, nobody, nobody really races carts and cars at the same time, I guess. And, and it's, it's, it just seems separated to me and it's very hard to, to find contacts in the car racing world from, from the car, cart racing world, if that makes sense. Like it's, um, and, and teams, some teams, I'm, I'm not not all of them but some teams in, in kart racing try to you know deter a karting driver from from making making it to car racing because you know they they lose a customer <laughs> right exactly. yeah. It, yeah it's true and a lot of people um don't think it's it's possible to make it in car racing especially coming from from a background like like i did or a lot of a lot of other drivers have um with, with not much money, you know, it's, it's almost impossible to do, you know? And uh, I think a, a lot of people in, in the kart racing industry kind of deter drivers from, I don't know, wasting their time or I don't, I don't know what it is, but um, yeah, you, you always hear, yeah. you always hear, especially in North America, you hear the, yeah. some will go, my dream is formula one. I want to race in formula one. We'll just call it that. Right. And you hear people right away go, why waste your time? Right. And it's just like, I couldn't imagine someone being like, if you play soccer in America, being like, hey, I want to play in the Premier League. And someone being like, don't waste your time. No, they're right. going to be like, you know what? That's a great goal. How are yeah. you going to try to achieve that? How are you going to yeah. work towards that? You know, can we can we set a plan? You know, it's kind of like what we talked in the last last podcast and previous podcasts. But it is interesting that there is that disconnect where people, they do, they did, they deter and, and shut down these dreams. And it's like, they can have that dream and it, mm -hmm. it's up to the parent and whoever's funding that person to say, you know what, we're going to give you all the tools to be able to do it. We may never be able to bring you to Europe, but we'll give you yeah. every tool that we can afford to get you there. Um, mm -hmm. But it's interesting. It, there are a lot of teams out there and a lot of individuals that have influence that, mm -hmm that say that stuff it's interesting yeah it's like mental sabotage <laughs> right you know and i don't know it's like and not all people you know no, no. some people try to help out but um it's and, just, and i'll add to that as well it's we need to in the end i mean it, it, it costs money but we in the u.s we need a program or multiple programs that allow karting teams to be somehow affiliated with with IndyCar teams, right? Yeah, you said and have have junior. Oh, yeah. I mean, you guys said it in the in the previous podcast. I think some some kind of uh, you know have the road to, road to Indy extended into kart racing. Yep. 
yeah you know or or the f3 or whatever it is you know it's you see it all the time in in europe um and these drivers have a clear path and and um a family of around them in the industry that can follow them and help them through through the ranks so um in the end it costs and it, it costs money you know it's you just need to put yourself in front of the right people and make it known that you're willing to do anything to make it. And you don't, you don't have a backup plan. I think that's what, that's what really helped. Um, I think my mindset is just, is knowing that I didn't have a plan B and that's risky too. Yes. Yeah. But I didn't have, I, I didn't have any other option, but to make it. Right. And I think, I think that really helped my, my work ethic and my mindset going into it. You know, I, I will do anything to make it here. I'll, I'll call anybody. Right. You know? The plan A mentality. Right. That's good. That's good. I mean, yeah. And it's so easy too for everybody to talk about how much racing is, you know, mm-hmm. like that, that is, it, it is riddled throughout carding is like, it, it's kind of like why waste your time? And there are, there are a few people that will be there to kind of help you out mm-hmm. and say, Hey, like go this way, talk to this mm-hmm. person. Right. You know, like get out of the bullshit. Like, right. don't mm-hmm. let that, but it's, it would be a cool thing to have something connected from the racing, the, the car world to mm-hmm. the karting world and making that one uniform kind of thing right now. It's mm-hmm. so, di- it feels like almost, I know it's not two different sports, but it kind of feels like it's just the two different industries and it almost feels yeah. like two different sports. Right. In it's a, a way. It, I, I see both sides too, because being involved with car 360 and then a lot of friends that are team owners and everything. And I can understand them being like, no, it's why, why should these series be a stepping stone to karting when we're pushing kids out at 14, 15 years old to leave the sport? Yeah. I understand that, but also it's the nature of the beast. It is always a stepping stone into car racing. It will always be. There's a reason why every single formula one driver on the grid started in karting. There's a yeah. reason, you know what I mean? It, it's, Yes. Are there people that started outside of karting that have made it in racing? 100%. But not a lot, right? Yeah. Most it's people. And, and there's tons of drivers you'll go up and down the list of, of guys that are, you know, racing sports cars or, you know, and that's a lot plan B for a lot of drivers as, you know, that go from karting into formula cars. But you'll be like, oh, where'd this guy? And then you realize, you, oh, they just raced, they raced carts. Of course they did. <laughs> but they maybe didn't have the money to go all the way up into, you know, GP3 and GP2 or, you know, they did one year of Formula No and then didn't have the money and switched. And, you know, there's plenty of um, really talented, especially now that GT3 racing is so popular. There's plenty of guys that you're like, wait a minute, I remember that name. That guy was like a top kart driver. Like mm-hmm. Mar- uh, Marcello now, that's a yeah. um, factory Mercedes driver. He was a Ferrari Academy driver, top karting driver, yeah. came up, realized, didn't really have a path forward with the Ferrari, Ferrari Driver Academy, and got picked up by, I think, uh, he was doing GP2 Antonelli Motorsports, and switched over, boom, and now he's factory Mercedes driver, and killing it. Wow. Absolutely killing it. Wow. So, it's important. Well, buddy, I know uh, I know you got a lot of things to do today, and we appreciate your time. Hey, it's, it's Saturday, man. There's not no not a whole lot. Of don't lie. You told me you had something to do, but uh, I, we really appreciate it. And hopefully, you know, we'll have you on the podcast after a few races and and get a little yeah, get a little update. And you know, yeah. we'll, we'll be watching. We're big fans of yours, so yeah, that'd be really cool. The podcast, yeah. Good to see you guys. Good talking. Awesome. You too. Thanks for having. Me. Yeah, see you at day. see you at Long Beach. Yeah. Yeah. LBGP. I think that's a big one. That's a big one. That's probably the second biggest race of the year for us. So. Do they have a sim for that? Yes. Ooh, that's good. <laughs> TJ's like a one on it. I know. Yeah. <laughs> like Jesus. Fly me to it's North Carolina. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, cool. All right. That's well, right. enjoy the rest of your weekend and uh, good luck. Take care. Later. Cool. So. Man, that was a great conversation with Oliver. I'm glad uh, glad he took the time out of his busy pre uh, preseason to to talk with us. Yeah. And uh, I am definitely rooting for that kid, man. Yeah, I've always, I've always been a fan of his. He's uh, back when we had when I was uh, doing all the things for Car 360. You know, I interviewed him quite a bit and became pretty good friends with him. Uh, 
and he's always been that same, just nice, honest, willing to give you honest answers, doesn't really beat around the bush, um, but still is that kind of clean cut Americana yeah. kind of guy. Yeah. Um, even though I know he has deep Swedish roots and spent the holidays in Sweden, but uh, he is, he, he's just, he's such a great kid and, and you can't help but root for him. Yeah. It is awesome to talk to him. And like, I think he should be our go-to for a little bit of Intel into IndyCar and just, I agree, you know, we'll get him back on. I he think, said he would. I think uh, the coolest part of the conversation is just like, especially from my point of view too, as a driver, you know, aspiring IndyCar driver at one point, it was like, you know, you always wonder what the step is and like what, what would it realistically take? And you only hear f like lore about what that's like, right? You know, to go from where we're at to India, or you or you hear it from someone years after, right? Like it, years, yeah. years after, it's, or as they're retiring, or, or once they're established, and they're like, oh well, you know, it was like this. Da da da. You have someone that's living it right now that's able to tell the story, which is super cool. Um, I know McLaren does uh, is pretty strong in their social media game these days. I would hope that they would do something very cool this year with two rookies in the team and follow their year. Um, I know they would probably be a little protective, kind of like that unbox they do with the, the F1 team. If they could do something with that with Oliver and Pato, I think it'd be really cool to see two rookies, two guys that do have experience, one that has experience um, like Pot and pa on Pato's side, similar age range, um, similar experience, but has already had a step into the higher level. Sorry, he's done an IndyCar race or two. Did the Super Formula, right? Did GP2. Yeah. Kind of in that European uh, upper echelon. Um, has that kind of already knows what the program is. So he has a little bit of, maybe a little bit of a leg up yeah. ov over Oliver in uh, at least the first race or two, maybe. Just because of that. But uh, I would love to continue. I, that would be. I would watch that every every after every race. If they, if they had like a 20, 30 minute video do after every race. Do you think they're going to do that though? I mean, is is there, is there like? Do you have? If you're wanting there? to build a brand, it's a no brainer. Okay, well, you, absolute no brainer. So you're giving some some intel, maybe some. I don't know. I'm saying if you want to build a brand around your IndyCar team, yeah, and no one else is doing that, of except course. for Penske a little bit. They sometimes do some videos on social media. Sure. Um, uh, when Scott McLaughlin, the V8 supercar guy, came over, they did a cool little video segment. They do that uh, Penske Games thing. Homeboy, that's pretty interesting. Homeboy did a test in an Indy car. I heard he Penske, was. I heard he was and quick. And he was really quick. I heard he was quick. So, hmm. And he's in the Penske program. And there's maybe a Penske driver or two that's going to leave soon. I don't know. I don't know. That's cool. Well, they said after the test, they publicly said they're going to look for races for him to do. So whether or not that means they decide to enter a car later in the season. I mean, or, how perfect would he be in a NASCAR program? Oh, come on. With his background? I'd love to see him do at least the road courses. Do they still with call Penske. it V8 supercars? Is that what they call it? I think they just call it supercars now. Australian okay, supercars. V6s, yeah. right? Yeah. So, no, that would be cool. But yeah, he drives heavy ass cars, a lot of horsepower, no tires. That don't turn? That's NASCAR. Supposedly they don't turn. We talked to Oliver uh, a little bit away from this, too doing the interview and or getting ready for the interview and he you know he kind of said you know it feels like a, a heavy go-kart that doesn't turn uh, in, in a way on mg is like a shifter car yeah lots of grip kind of doesn't turn not as responsive as you would think um which i'm sure lends itself to that obviously the v8 supercars the supercars are softer right yeah. but maybe that feeling of really having to wait and, and be patient with the car yeah uh lends itself to that so so all you carters there's something go start to go go ar, go start testing your shifter card on MGs and uh, yeah, make it not turn and just go straight to IndyCar. Yeah, skip the tr skip the road to Indy. You don't need the whole thing. No, come on, come on. Yeah, build some understeer in the front of that go kart and just test, 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 and test. Baby. There you go. Maybe simulate races if you want. Yeah, you know, two I, hours I think, I think pit stops. Cool. There you go. Yeah, have a coach mix it up with you. There you go. Done. Be willing to crash. <laughs> Be willing to crash. <laughs> I love that. No, but I mean, kind of on the uh, to transition a little bit. V eight supercars. Give us um, some sports car stuff. I'm tired of these yeah. twenty car bullshit. I know. Bathurst twelve hour happening right now. I think they're in hour three of the race. Okay. So I had you watch some of the craziness that happened uh, during qualifying, which it's one of the most exciting. The format they have, and they do it at 
Spa. They do it at m- most of the big endurance races now. Yeah. A part of that kind of that GT3, uh, GT4 program that they have that does like the Spa 24 hour, Nurburgring 24 hour, the shootouts that they do. So it's two qualifyings and a shootout. Top 10 go into the shootout. Uh, I think it's, they mix the qualifying. So like, Qualifying one, a and a B. they they have some other cars that are in the qualifying that don't go into like a different category okay. that don't go into qualifying two, and then qualifying two, um, and you have to start with the fuel load. I think it's like a park from a type condition. Yeah, that you have to start with that fuel load. So like you have to burn off fuel if you want to be as light as you can for your go lap to get into the top ten, and I think you reset for the top ten shootout, but. The heat there, I heard, is insane this year. Um, I watched the qualifying live last night. The amount of total binned cars totaled, you're not going to race tomorrow, wrecks that happened, was insane. And they did some interviews with some of the drivers that have experience there, uh, like um, Dave Reynolds. Uh, And he said, you know, a lot of it is the heat. And I think drivers, especially the ones that don't have that experience that they have at Bathurst. Um, so more of the international guys know the kind of a lap time or how the car or their points of reference of where they make their lift or, yeah. you know, that lap time that they know they should be able to shoot for. And when they're a second, second and a half off because of the extreme heat, they're trying to push to that and trying to give it everything in qualifying for a 12 hour race where qualifying in some regards matters, but in reality doesn't matter. No, I was about to ask, like, this is a 12 hour race. Right. Anything can happen. Um, I think when you label it shootout. Right. You know, some, some people get a little tongue twisted in there. But you saw the wrecks. I they were insane. They're huge. They're big write offs. Write offs. Done. Toast. They're gone. Car's done. You're not tubbing it. It's done. No, no, no. You're never touching that car. No. Again. So. You know, there are little mistakes, granted, and especially when it's, like, greasy like that. If you're on a knife's edge like you are at Bathurst, and, you know, that circuit, it's so... We only know it from a sim, people. Yeah. But yeah. even on the sim... L- would love to drive there, but... It is yeah. so knife edge. Yeah. I mean, seriously, it's one of the hardest tracks to drive on on a sim. You it, got, like... Yeah. There's a lot of time to be... Green. There's a lot of time to be found in a small, small amount of racetrack, and once you get it, it's, like... It's eye opening, right? You're like, whoa. Because I remember when I first started hill. going with our buddy Zach and we were going back and forth, and he kind of had some time on me in the beginning. Yeah. And then I figured something out and put, and it took him a little while to catch back up to me. Yeah. It, it, it's that kind of like it clicks that one section, the downhill, and understanding how to get the flow, where to make that lift, where, where, how to turn, you know, make sure you're in still the line. And if you're just a little, little outside of it, or you literally just missed the turn in. Again, you're going into a wall where you would normally drop two wheels into the grass or into yeah. the ground or whatever the runoff is, right? You're no, you're into the wall, like you saw in the Aston Martin wreck. Yeah, yeah. You know, it, he What's he barely section? barely touched the wall, right. nicked it, but and then he rode going, off the car. You're going so he fast slid there. after that, slid the car, flipped, rode off the car. Yeah, yeah, and you're, uh, I mean. It depends. I mean, you're you're fighting for tenths of a second, but in qualifying, sometimes you don't even know what you're fighting for. You just know that it's so competitive, you have to be on the limit. So all these drivers are finding that limit. Well, and if we're going to be honest, as a racing driver and competitive, and whether or not you're trying to keep a job, or even if you're a name, I think if you're a name and you've been there for a little bit of time, you're not, not worried about it too much, but we're all competitive, man. It always man. matters. It matters. You, the worst thing, the especially I think even more so as a professional, the worst thing, is for you to be the 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 third or fourth fastest Porsche, right? Yeah. Or your your teammate in the, in your second car went half a second faster than you in the same car, mm-hmm. right? So you're pushing, and you know there's so much inter uh, or not inter, but manufacturer battles in the GT3 stuff right now. Yeah. You have a, you know, right now you have McLaren, you have BMW, you have Lamborghini, you have the Nissan, you have Porsche, you know, I'm sure I'm missing one or two other, the the Audi, the Aston. So you got what, six, seven top manufacturers in the world of supercars, Ferrari, you have Ferrari there. So eight, you have eight of the top manufacturers. You have all the factory drivers, all the top names there, right? This is, this is the first major race of the season 
where of the GT3 style cars, not Daytona 24 hour, but where you're that? like, it's full on qualifying shootout of 30 of these badass GT3 cars, and you want to puff your chest out and a little it's bit. Hot. You want to puff your chest out a little bit. Yeah, you got to flex. You you know. Oh, this and car Bentley. Is fast. Bentley's there too. Oh, yeah. With some wrecks. Because we talked about the Oliver Jarvis wreck, where yeah, it looks like he breaks. lost the brakes or at least had brake fade. At a very scary spot. That is a, I mean. Very scary because it's but fast. It's but it's the one the runoff. Fastest area. part of the track. But if you're right, it's the one area with the largest runoff. And you yeah. see, it, it wasn't, it there was damage, but it could have been worse. Could have been worse. But I don't, maybe in the downhill, the last downhill before you get on that back straight, if you lose brakes there, that could be really like because it's almost like cement. You might be going right into cement. Yeah. Anyway, so uh, I think it's like I don't know enough about Bathurst, but just from like pushing on a qualifying lap when you have a twelve-hour race, there's it is so much like it's a professional. You could, like a professional driver has to know these things too. It's a twelve-hour race. Mercedes. I forgot Mercedes too. Sorry, I'm just, things are going through my head. (laughs) I'm like, there's Mercedes. Uh, It has to be nine. We'll write it down on a piece of paper. But everybody's there. Everyone. But it's a 12-hour race. And so much shit is going to happen. Count on that. Pit stops alone will change 5, 10, 20, 30 seconds in a race. Yeah. So one second between you and whomever at the start is like kind of a little obsolete. Well, and it's, you know... There's a lot of cars there that have the one lap pace, but yeah. don't have the race pace, right? There's a lot, so so you got to think so about maybe, that, right? There's a lot of cars that kind of have that. Maybe they just need one the lap pace and can do it. Well, that's what it's about too. Lap. It's about that. It's all about that, right? I mean, that's one of the things. That this is, you know, know, the the, the closest thing we have to win on Sunday, buy on Monday, left in motorsports, is the GT3 racing right now and GT4 racing. That's it. We have nothing else that applies. Not even the GTLM cars. Well, what's coming? What's coming? What do we have in the future? Hypercars. <laughs> Hypercar. Hypercar. Is that that's big not news? Something we can buy though. Uh, it's representative. It's representative of because they're supposed to look very close to that hypercar. How do you like it? I love it. Not hate it. I love it and disagree with it. So I would say that. Replacing that with what was LMP1 is such a good idea. It's a good idea because I think they're restrict, and I don't, I didn't read enough of what the rules, uh, what they're presenting, but I think it restricts it enough, kind of like the GT3 stuff, mm-hmm. where it restricts it enough where Audi can't come in and just outspend people. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, it's it, that LMP1 stuff. You literally had to. It was so expensive that even the smaller car manufacturers couldn't be a part of it. Yeah. That it was that's close to being a Formula One budget, if not a Formula One budget, to do it. That with not any of the fan base that exists. Right. So, and you look at that car and you go, "It's really cool. It's sexy. Love it." But I can't go buy that car. It doesn't represent. And yes, that technology does trickle down. There's a lot of technology that's trickled down from that. Track this. Track this for a second. Let's take a beat. Aston Martin just announced as. Force India, now known as Sport Pesa Racing, now futurely known in 2021 as Aston, Aston Martin, Martin Racing, Racing, which debunks the whole Toto Wolf stroll going to buy Mercedes. Yes. That, dude, there's so much. Clearly, mo- there's like a door that shut, and now. Or, or, oh. or, this is me being not conspiracy theorist, but I'm looking Please. way in the future here. The Mercedes closing doors rumor is not dead. It's not dead. You see it? No, I'm saying it's not dead yet. They haven't come out and, and announced that they're not doing it. They're not going to walk away or who knows what it's going to be. Who says Toto Wolf that doesn't go to, and there still is a connection between Stroll and Toto, mm. and Toto goes and takes his infrastructure to Point Racing. Yeah, it's so easy and, to And uh, elevates that with Aston Martin and, and, that, and that kind of money because yeah. Stroll has... The infrastructure. Because Stroll has the money... To yeah, he can convince a lot of people. Well, no, he has this money to self-fund, yeah, legitimately self-fund a Formula One team that puts the amount of money in needed. I wonder how much to, that sets him back. To, to you know what I mean, but to do, do a proper budget, like a Mercedes Formula One budget, he yeah. has that kind of money. He's a billionaire. That's so here's an, he's a billionaire. Yeah, he's a billion. I think he's a billionaire. 
So here's I an interesting story. How much story. that sets him back? Like how much he's like at the end of the year, he's like two more years. I of can't believe like, I spent this much money this yeah, year. Yeah, like two more. Years. I gotta sell Prima soon, guys. Like, so, so I, right. <laughs> like I gotta get rid of that. People office. know about that. Is that like known? They, wow. Well, Are they, I don't know. I don't know how I knew that. <laughs> <laughs> well, any. The thing he son his son's son drives he right. owns right they yeah right? like you just follow his career and it's like he's still I'm sure like, not if shitting a on stroll team, but there's a karting team that probably he owns that he doesn't even fucking know what remember they do. anymore yeah right. he doesn't even what's the still team own name a percentage again? of it uh, WTF F1 or WTF1 uh, did a pretty cool I think it was them did a pretty cool thing about stroll and they were like is he even good. <laughs> <laughs> but it he was is. actually I you mean, remember like if you go back away from Formula One, you forget the kid is talented. Yeah, he actually is talented. He it is. sucks that he is. T- it, he gets, he's got to fight that. It the is whole tied. Way it, it sucks that he's tied to his dad. I don't think he would have lasted in Formula One without his dad. No, but you forget the kid is actually talented. Yeah, and he got results and he won all the way through his junior Formula career. Well, won all the way through. Well. Pretty much. So you it wasn't cannot, his rookie year. It does, that he won no, it was. It, it was or wasn't. Wasn't. No, but he still won. But, but was he in the best he team? The yes, he still won. He the car's not driving him. He was in a Prima car. The car's not driving had him. The number one plate on the car. Just a force to be reckoned with. It's so representative. The car is not like, driving him. Nothing. This is not Robo Race. I, I get that. I, I, I'm just making the case. That he like, beat all his I'm other sure Prema teammates. If we got all the F3 racers from that year in oh, on well, this podcast, they would all be salty. They'd be like, they'd be so salty. <laughs> they'd be so be salty. Thirty more horsepower. He was, uh, you know, the one VW engine. He was always in the wind tunnel. His car was in the wind tunnel, not ours. Yes. He got the bits. We didn't get the bits. Yeah, the front end. Come on, look at his front Okay, end. and I'm not... I don't know uh, that. But This is speculation, but I mean, come on. With, with let's put unlimited two, resources... Two and two equals four. Look, with unlimited resources, we all go there yes. because we all suffer the consequences yes. when we don't have the resources. Yes. We're like, God damn it. Yeah. That motherfucking wind tunnel. You know, like, that front end would get really That good. ruined Formula 3. With the, wind, the wind tunnel. The wind tunnel testing. Yeah. Ruined Formula 3. What about the engine disparity? That didn't help. Um, but from my understanding... So my weird. From my understanding... Most uh, series are spec junior formula. Yeah, from my, under- from my understanding from uh, a couple of people I know, in F3, drivers, uh, one team owner, the wind tunnel was the, the biggest thing that it's just... It's why the budget's as high as it is. Uh, you can't even if because it's it's so competitive, right? If you can find it is one tenth of a second, half a tenth out of the car, yeah, right. You don't even have to work for it. Every other team, and it's not even that. It's a selling point for your team to get the best drivers to get the most money because if you have wind tunnel access and you're able to go to the wind tunnel, and you're able to sell that to team to to drivers. I mean, to say hey. We got a wind tunnel. We go to the wind tunnel. Oh, those guys don't go to the wind tunnel. In your mind, you're how going. Many, how many guys? How many guys are? How many teams? Are everyone's in the, wind, in the tunnel? wind tunnel. It's about how much time you can spend in the wind tunnel. Everyone's in the wind tunnel. Guarantee it. I've never been in a wind tunnel. No. No. It's cool. It's interesting. Really? Yeah. There's a lot of knowledge to be. There's a lot of knowledge. A lot of knowledge. And why? Do the you littlest need more time? things. Why it's, do you need more time? It's this. Hey, it's the same reason why NASCAR cars go in the wind tunnel when. Theoretically, you're not supposed to change anything, yeah. and it's a spec, right? Have you ever seen tech? I know. Have you ever seen tech? NASCAR's ridiculous. Have you seen? About tech. Have you seen the I amount s- of different plates they put on the car to make sure it fits a certain dimension? Yeah, I've seen it up close and personal. The it's way it's insane, th- and all those guys still go to the wind tunnel to just move thousandths of an inch. You know how much different there- move the wind, different areas to find on an oval half a tenth or two one hundredths because two one hundredths can be the difference between the ride third height? and first. Just first start and- with the ride height that the cars have to go through tech with. Yeah. That when aero gets pushed on the cars, what? They go, is it half an inch? Is it an inch it's difference? In- disparity? It's, it's something insane. where you have to go through tech, roll through. When you're dry, you're not out of race run, whatever, and you have to pass the certain uh, 
amount. I wish I knew. And, you know, we need we need someone to just throw it up there so we wouldn't be blabbering on about this shit. But there is there is some amount of ride height that they need to be. And it's a lot higher than what they run at, which is literally on the ground. I think we may have a guest appearance. We have a little visitor here. I think we might have a visitor. We'll see if he comes in. He can hear me. Well, the point is, my we're son. Talking about oh, so people know, so we're not like, oh, well, a visitor. We have a mouse, like a guest mouse or something. <laughs> well, my son's <laughs> here, and uh, he misses dad, so he might he might make a small appearance. He's obsessed, which we've talked about. Yeah. He's obsessed with cars and everything. So that's uh, very fun. You got to reconcile yeah. with that. I do. So moving on. Uh, well, okay. So we talked about it, it was we took a little side stuff about Sport Pesa turning Aston Martin. Yep. Which is Aston Martin showing a bit of sign that maybe, hmm, why would you be investing in Formula One? You have, I mean, you have a sports car well, team that is. Well, Aston Martin's not investing in Formula One. Stroll buying Aston Martin is so investing is, in did Formula he One. Buy Aston Martin. From my understanding, he bought Aston Martin. I would love to start a car. I'm going to be young Jamie here, real quick. I would love Keep to talking. be a car manufacturer rooted in racing you know and not make the best road cars like they're very good and they're fun and they're awesome but they lack like real everyday daily driver helpful things okay Air it's con. not he didn't buy okay he buys a ma majority or a big stake in the company for 240 million dollars so he doesn't say whether or not he, okay, he purchased a 16.7% stake of Aston Martin, so he definitely does not have. Majority. <laughs> well, no, a company that size, 167 may be um, not necessarily majority, but, a but it could amount. be a large stake. Yeah, something, that's a old international, a lot of different money has flown through that over the years. That could be a big share of the company. For $239 million, um, and Aston Martin shares leaped 25% with that uh, investment. So that's that's interesting. Wow. But with that money, a contingency maybe was, I'm going to bring in this money, but you need to do this, this, and this. And that's buying or rebranding um, Point Pesa, whatever, Point sure. Racing. I think That could have easily been. I think that's such a good move. Yeah. I think Sport Pesa, who? who? Yeah, you know, I know. Like that was we, weird. What are we talking about? That was about? weird. Who are we talking about? Um, real quick, we're going to take a little break. Two seconds and we'll get back going. Okay. All right. Pause real quick. Quick pause. What were we talking about? Uh, Aston Martin and why they are in Formula One and it looks like the hypercar. Sure. And they've shown great interest in it. And I, I think the point that was being made is just like, look, they're now developing an a whole program centered around Formula One racing, which is not the format of drive on Sunday, buy on Monday type right. of, you know, application. Like consumers, I, I feel like it's, you know, you see it a little bit with manufacturers. Obviously, there's a push, you know. Well, Ferrari and with that, is, with, with Aston Martin, right, it's a uh, very small group of consumers. Sure. It's not mass market like a Honda or Infinity Nissan or Chevrolet or Ford or anyone like that. And, you know, obviously speaking with Formula One, you know, Aston Martin doesn't really make, it's not like um, Ford with their GT program where they make other cars, right? They make lower end cars. Right. So, you know, you're building brand equity across the board, right? Aston Martin has a specific customer. You have fans and people that aspire to own an Aston Martin, right? Mm -hmm. But it is interesting that, they are putting that much effort and money into something that may not really pay off financially. Yeah. Like it seems like it's like not that they're washing money, but it seems it's weird <laughs> that like that's a lot of money to be spent on something that is hard to say that it would bring that and, and you'd make money you'd make your money back. Let on. alone work out. Right. Let alone be like competitive. Right. You know, you can't shoot for like finishing P1. 
you know? Like no. that can't be in your, your headspace at all. You no. can't think that you're gonna shoot to the top of the time charts and like be the team and like that's all the And it would be it's weird that Aston Martin would put their name on a program that that's, is that best case number one of the B cars. Right. And is always thought of as Force India still. That's always. the thing. Everyone still always. says Force India. It's Sport Pesa, but it's like Force India. You, oh, I still think of it as... I don't even know... And it is. It's Force India. It's the same people. All the Formula One teams. That's how that works, right? You buy the infrastructure. When yeah. a team goes goes bye-bye, you know? Yeah. It's, you buy the infrastructure. Um, also, it's not like they're super dominant and in GT cars. And it's like, that's kind of like where... Right. That's where this... But you got to remember, that's is. also... The their success in GT racing has very little to do with Aston Martin. That is that is a lot with the um, people have been involved, the kind of third party people have been involved in developing their um, their cars, mm. their their race cars. Mm. Um, Aston Martin itself, you know, they have that platform, but it's not like Porsche where Porsche is building and developing their race car, right? So. Like with the DTM program, so our it's line, team. It's yeah, the team that is hoisting. or our sport. It's kind of like uh, it's kind of like Yost with Mazda. Yes, actually, yeah, it's it's very similar to that. Where you know, it's not really Aston Martin that's delivering a customer car. It's not Audi, right? It's not like Audi's delivering a customer car. Yeah, it's the customer car is really developed by a different entity that has a partner that racing. has a partnership with them. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, interesting. It's it's quite a bit. It's a quite a bit different. Yeah. Okay. So th- we took a. A, a little right turn there, but As getting back on track, the hyper car uh, and that it's set to replace LMP1, which I like, and I and and spending a little bit of time in like an LMP3 um, with my own experience. So does LMP? Okay, not yeah. to interrupt. Yeah, go. Does LMP2 and L- LMP3 make sense anymore? I think that LMP2, take it out. I think LMP3. Take it out. It doesn't. It look. If you're not going to have LMP, a proper LMP car, we'll just call it prototype. Yeah. Just call it because here's the thing, and I'll tell you why LMP3 should stay. Okay. LMP3 has not proven to be a ladder system at all. Any of the drivers that have been successful in it, there's been no ladder to LMP2 to LMP1. You look at the guy it's that true. won LMP3 championship last year. He's kind of lost in the fray in LMP2, and LMP2 is so uncompetitive. And then there's one guy, right? And it, it just doesn't make sense. So I think and, you're right. And the budget is big, and so it's like LMP3. I think is a standalone prototype racing series that's fast enough, and it is what it is. It's a pro am category. Make it that. Yeah. They like it's, it has first, its it has its place. Yes, IMSA first when they first championed it. It was like this kind of like in between of like you could also be an AM and race it, but also you could be a pro pro and race it. Right. And now they finally committed to pro am. And I think it's a good format to get pro drivers that aren't pro yet. They're not gold. So they're silver guys right. that get lost in the fray and all these other shit. And they're like, everybody's looking for the amazing like bronze driver yeah. that's super quick. This is a place where if they have the right guy, low amount of budget relative to everything else and you get to go racing and you get to at least get some experience driving right. a lot of racetracks win races whatever you want to do it's a standalone right and that has its place lmp2 that's You're right. a lot most, of budget because most of the guys that got lmp2 and definitely lmp1 are those gp3 gp2 expats that mm-hmm. couldn't get into formula one or had a stint in Formula One and got the ride because, as we've talked about previously, yeah, that man that raises your stock. If, totally. if you're if you're a, a top level open wheel driver, yeah. it raises your stock than being a fast LMP driver. And you're right, there are you know the C, you you don't hear of many excellent LMP three guys. And look, I don't pay enough attention to LMP three, but I I definitely look at the results. And look at the like on IMSA's uh, where you can look at like all the fastest laps by drivers sure, and everything. Sure. And it's interesting to see sometimes the results. And this is like the yeah. same in uh, the new wow, what do they call it? The Michelin Pilot Challenge or whatever they call it. Right. The fastest drivers, fastest times, and who wins the races is 
vastly different. Sure. Where normally it's, you know, the fastest car, fastest driver combo up is, is up there. And you'll see guys that are like a second off the pace, like a car that's almost a second off the pace that mm-hmm. still wins mm-hmm. some of these races. So, you know, it's, is it really a great place for you? Uh, like you say, you, it's easy to move up. You kind of get lost in the fray. Yeah. I think my biggest, when I was racing in it, my biggest, like, when you could get lost in the fray is being like, here's the timesheets. Right. Nothing else about results. And we had results, but it was like, if you like think that's just a number on a car and that's the whole thing, I don't, I'm not in it. Here's the timesheets. Right. Fast slap by driver. And you right. go in and it's like, if you're in the top three out of like 50 guys that right. ended up, you know, registering a lot right. of time. Okay, like we're here to talk, you know, and that's how you (laughs) had to do it. Let's have a talk. And either way, though, that means nothing for how you move up in the sports car world. Right. Literally nothing. Right. There's no scholarship money to be gained. No. There's no. uh, Well, and even even some of these scholarships, like I said, 2020 knew me, not hating. Not hating. But uh, even this year, some of the new scholarship or or development drivers I've seen on the list is is interesting to say. Are you well, saying for the Indy? No, or, in the sports where? car world. Like some of the, it's just interesting to see some of the guys. And obviously there's, look, we're not in the position to know these people's in, ins and outs and, and know how they act off the track or how well they are at developing yeah. um, or their feedback. But it, I've, I've just seen some some people got get selected in these development programs this year. I'm like, huh. And it could be a mixture of who's ju- still doing development programs. Who, who's uh, Porsche, Lamborghini, Ferrari oh, has a small right. one. BMW has a small one. Has one. Yeah. But there's just and part of it is being open to that, right? There's still guys in the open wheel world that probably get offered or get phone calls. Hey, are you interested? You, you, you want to come test with us? And maybe they test or maybe they say, No, I'm racing GP2, GP3. This is like or Road to Indy, right? I'm sure. I'm on this path, and they they kind of shun that, Commit and maybe that's it. part of it, right? Maybe we we don't see some of these names we thought would, you know, that aren't on that path that you're like, oh, these guys are definitely going to IndyCar or Formula One, sure. but they're sticking to it, and they're they're you know they're gonna die <laughs> trying to drive <laughs> trying 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 to drive a, and a those open wheel car professionally, and, and those offers won't be there afterwards, and they won't be there afterwards, but it's just surprising, you know? Yeah. 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 And, and so, okay. So I think standalone, you got, I think, unfortunately, a lot of people don't want to hear this, but LMP2 has got to go. And we've I agree. Hanging, it's got to go. Hanging on to it. It's got, it's how many car. cars did it have in 24 hours Daytona? What, and like six? Five or six. And that's best case for the whole year. Right. You're most likely going to have two to three. Well, and one pulled out. Weird, now you're going to have two or three. Yeah, they have the weird schedule, right? It's a weird points championship. Yeah. 24 hours of Daytona isn't included. Oh, I know. So we don't know if that's actually the full season runners. I think it... Well, I don't think but it grew from hell? last year. Let me, let me ask and you And it's this. not going to grow now, knowing what they just announced. Let me ask you So people this. aren't going to spend money on it. Why would anyone... Tr- why would you rather win the IMSA LMP2 championship... Versus winning in LMP2, versus winning the Rolex 24 Hours of Daytona in LMP2. Why? No, I'm all I'm about s- Daytona. I'm all like, sorry. Daytona, all in. Sorry, all in at Daytona. Give me my Rolex. I don't care about the rest of the season, but also the Rolex 24 Hours of Daytona. Let's talk about first that. Of all, first of all, <laughs> I love because some of my uh, friends have won previously and just won. And uh, I love the the subtle. They don't do it on purpose, and a lot of it's like their friends showing showing it off for them on social media. But I love the like week after, day after, like flex with the rocks because I'd be the same way. Yeah. I'd never take it off my wrist. Right. I'd right. be like sleeping with this thing. It's never coming off for <laughs> at least a month or two. But I love. I, I always get a kick out of you know, the especially some of the guys that are uh not the loudest personalities but I there's I knew it just like subtle about. flexes <laughs> and sometimes like i said sometimes it's not them doing it it's their friends or teammates and or they're out 
and about yeah, yeah, at a yeah. test the next week, getting ready for the rest of the season yeah, or coaching funny. someone. And the guy's like, oh, and they're in a meeting. They're kind of, you know, they make it look like they're doing something. <laughs> and it's really not. But it's just funny to they're see. They're all of a sudden like writing notes. They're writing notes with their left hand when they're right handed. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, no, it's cool. So um, that's fun. I'll, I'll give a big shout out to uh, Ben Hanley, Colin Brown, um, and Brian Sellers on on their achievements. It's super, super yeah. cool. Brian Sellers is well deserved. Well deserved. Long time coming. Well, well overdue. Yeah. He is, uh, you know, we talk about Dane kind of being uh, that under underrated. We were talking about that off the podcast. Oh, that's right. We were. See? Dane being that kind of underrated, and, and maybe a lot of people don't know, but. That guy's a superstar. Superstar. And Dane and Brian. Underrated. Dane and Brian go way back. And um, Brian, you could say, maybe not a big brother, but definitely a little bit of a uh, a training partner, mentor to him um, early in his sports car career. Mm. And uh, Brian, I think, is, is that other guy that got overlooked. You know? Um, you think who, I th- who did I, Brian I, Sellers get overlooked by? everyone i think i think he should be a factory driver for someone and he's not and he's not and it's crazy to so me. he's like he he's not personally funded but he's funded by like no i mean he's different. he's he's a professional racer he raced for falcon tires yeah. right that was his big first kind of like real big big sports car contract so that's a factory driver for a manufacturer they're a tire manufacturer but not but i know they make i as know much money as i know 50 50 he put down um he was in, uh, toe-to-toe with Wolf Hensler, factory Porsche driver, um, on outright pace, um, on on over the course of the stint pace. I think even he was a little bit better on average. Mm. Um, and I know Brian got invited to, to do a lot of the Porsche winter tests that they did, the fitness stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, and I learned a lot about fitness through that um, training with Brian when I was still racing. Mm. But he, uh, it was always surprising to me. I think it was because of his age. They always were looking for that younger, but it's the same thing. Like he's been with Lamborghini now for a little bit. You're telling me he's not factory Lamborghini material? Like, come on. Like, dude. Oh, like, get out of here. And it could be a little bit like not speaking for Brian. It's hard though. Not speaking for Brian. Brian's a family man. Um, Got uh, wonderful kids, wonderful wife. And she's in the in the industry too. Oh, that's um, cool. So it could be a little bit like that lifestyle, right? He's an Ohio boy. Like it could be that lifestyle isn't for him. I don't. Uh, we we oh. talked about this a long time ago. I don't know where he's at right now. But be good to get him on. We, I'll give I'll give him a little shout. Yeah. I'd but you know, it's him. it's like maybe I like a good example is Andy Lally. Andy Lally has no desire to do Le Mans. Zero. He gets invited to do Le Mans all the time. No desire to do it. Did it like one or two times done cool really? did it no desire I'd like to know doesn't want to keep going back why i don't well, think I'd... it's important to him no i just don't think it's important to him oh. you know uh, the nask when he did the nascar stuff that was super important to him it was always a childhood dream of him of his to be a nascar so he put a lot of focus on that i just don't think in his racing resume or what he cares about in life it's not it doesn't bring him joy no, not joy i just Whoa. don't think it it brings him anything that he needs to go over and spend that time over there that's joy doing it, you know he did it he accomplished it yeah he's one of the most accomplished sports car drivers in american sports car history like yeah what i mean everyone's different right yeah so we bring it to daytona um, did you watch Daytona this year? This I is did. the first year I didn't watch it. This is kind of the part first of it. Year. I was busy, but this I didn't is the watch first it. Year that I've really like watched it pretty pretty hard and followed all the action. So we talked about this in episode one. Yeah, what happened? For, I mean, first of all, Mazda Mazda looked like they were the ones, and then first good all, old number ten, good old number ten, yeah. dude. Like, talk about. They are the Patriots. Kobe. Ashi. They are the Patriots of Grand Am IMSA. Yeah. Racing. They are. Yeah. They're the pat. They're the Pats, man. Wayne Taylor it's Racing. Crazy. That ten car doesn't matter who's in the car either. I know, but doesn't but Kobe, matter. Kobayashi, dude, was pretty so stellar. I heard. I heard. And, and even with the little penalty, you know, and and he honed up to it right away. They didn't even like contest it. It was like probably like a two second little mistake that he went off the pit limiter early when he's coming out of the pits. Easy mistake to do. Has a drive-through penalty from yep. the lead. 
which is like, oof, that hurts. Yeah. You know, like any team is going to be like, God, like, really? God, come on. You're a professional, man. Rolex 20. You raced in Formula One. Yeah. You're telling me, like, he won Le Mans too, right? Didn't I don't he? know. Did he? Didn't he with Alonso? With they won, I think they won Le Mans together. It sounds I think like he it. was teammates with. You've convinced but me. But still. Let's pull it up. We can't do that. Young, we that young, young Chris, pull yeah. it up. Pull, I got it. it. Keep talking. Yeah. We got it. So, uh, but he, I mean, was really impressive. Everyone's saying too, like, uh, even Dixon said, Kobayashi threw the bus stop. He could not understand how much speed he was carrying into it. <laughs> you see the data? Scott Dixon not, said not that. Not possible. Scott Dixon said that. No, not possible. <laughs> it's crazy. That's funny. Five, what? Scott Dixon, five time IndyCar champion. Right. Is saying that. Uh, he's on rails. He has something that's else. Dope. He has another gear. And that's so cool because Kobayashi is so under the radar. Nakajima was the one that won 19 and 18. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Hold on. I still think he won. Let me look back. I'm looking back. Go ahead. Keep so, going. but yeah. I think Kobayashi, what, after his Sauber days in Formula One, has flown so under the radar and has kind of flighted to different teams, hasn't had an allegiance to teams. Uh, maybe if you, you prove some data against me. He maybe didn't win overall, but he may have won in class. But I don't think, yeah, I don't think he didn't win. Way, he didn't win with Toyota. But either way. Right. He's a know? boss. And, and, and Especially very, in sports car racing. What they were boss. saying is very, like, understated. He's, he's quiet. Doesn't just come. You know, there's not yeah. a lot... That you're like the presence you don't like feel like a right. superstar at all yet he comes in and he's bloody fast yeah, that's so cool love that it's so cool and love then he that. goes out and wins the rolex 24 and it's you know someone that you it's not an american it's not someone that you're like totally like right. i know his whole background i'm following this and you kind of love it yeah and and the wayne taylor racing group uh they have a really cool organization you know bmw winning gtlm they surprised everyone. I think. Porsche well, especially had, after last year, right? Like last year, that car only had one or two tracks that it was decent yeah, at. The rest right. of it, it was like I know almost DFL on outright pace, right? Race pace. I think they were a little bit better, but the still. But it was I like think VIR. They could hold it together. Yeah. But everywhere else, kind of fell apart, and and it proved that the longevity of the setup was what could win Daytona yeah. because it's it's really it's hard in a 24-hour race to have an outright like you know mono e mono head-to-head battle you know you had that with right. Wayne Taylor's a couple of years ago but to really have that battle come to the end on the lead lap like that with Porsche and BMW that's what you that's what you live battle. that's it's what you live what, for. it's what you live for and it just the Porsche could not hang over a long run distance when in all of the testing and qualifying Porsche had outright pace, but it's like, you got to follow average lap time through a stint of 60 laps, oh. 80 laps. Do you think, do you think BMW knew they had something and maybe were, I think, flew under the radar on purpose? I think that someone was saying something about the tire compound. Yeah. They went with a little bit softer. BMW did? Uh, or no, Porsche did. That makes sense. So over the long run, they maybe struggled a little bit. Yes. Thinking and they, they could had just control the pace. They can control the pace. And you could tell. You could tell when after a pit stop, um, I can't remember the guy. It was Tandy and I think Bamber on the yeah. other car. But right out of the box, super quick. And it was when John Edwards handed off the car to, I can't remember the guy's name. Um, but American? He's an American. Dave Felipe. No. No, he didn't. He didn't win. Oh, Dave Felipe wasn't in the I car that I, won. I think it was Herta's car, uh, and Herta and Felipe, D. Felipe, and I didn't know there was another American anymore in the BMW. I don't know if it was an American. Thought the only two Americans that were like long term on the team were Edwards and uh, no, Dave Felipe. Oh, what's the guy? Young Chris. Young Chris. Yeah, I'm back on the mic. Okay. Uh, BMW driver though, and he was. He was on it. He was on it. That's cool. So once the car was passed off from Edwards, um, at first you're thinking like, mm, five, you know, four or five second gap, and he's falling back. And then he gets in the sweet spot and just starts motoring. So he had everything there, and car was there at the end, and just, I mean, built past, built the gap, and just left the Porsche, you know, and really like made a statement in GTLM. That's cool. But the Rolex 24 
as a competition. And I mean, as a fan of the sport, I really felt like I am not getting the whole story here, nor do I care. And it was really, it was a weird feeling because... I know what you mean, though. I, I did mean. not... I, I This might be something with... And I, th- look, I'm fully speculating from... Crone? Oh, sorry, not... Go ahead. Yeah, there was an, another American... Might have been Jesse Crone. But he's not American. Okay, well, maybe I got that wrong. Jesse Crone, Edwards, Mostert, and Farfus. And, I think it was... And Mostert I think it was and Crone. Farfus are guys that travel all over the world for, I think it was Jesse for their Crone. stuff. Jesse yeah, Crone got in and... Took over and took that baby home. And then, oh, yeah, because Dave Felipe and Spengler are the two drivers that are going to race the whole season together for BMW in Herda's the second in car. It. Herda and then Philip Eng is uh, is another guy, factory BMW driver yeah. that just travels all over the world for him. So, so it's just for the longer races. Yeah. And then uh, GTD, I struggle. I paid only attention, to be honest, mainly to the GTD just because most of the People that know Team ATL, most of Team ATL people are there in that category. And I had my boy Sellers and Pompelli and Lally battling it out. Um, and that was fun to watch because they went back and forth, back and forth, yeah. who was in the lead. So that was cool. And I, no matter who won between the two of them, it, I would have been pumped. So Yeah, and surprised too by the Porsche and GCD that um, I don't know what happened at the end. Who was who was the they, was it Hardwick Hard, Long? Hard, Long Faf. No, Hardwick and Long. Hard with Wright. But the, but the Paf was up were, there too. Faf was up there at the beginning. Oh. I mean, they they were maybe they the wrecked or something. They were the car to beat. That's what I happens had. when I don't pay enough attention to a race. Either way, though. Oh, well, I'm just going through the list. Shout out to Shinya Mashimi. I think this was his first Daytona 24 Hour kid. I used to race against when I was. Uh, Still racing carts just for fun at the end. Um, there's a name of someone that just grinds it out. Part of did Lamborghini I Super Trofeo, right? But did Super Trofeo worked his way up, um, got part of that Lamborghini program, went over to Asia for a little bit, and I think he did his he did now. Um, Meyer Shank Acura, that's sick. That's really, oh, really? cool. Dang, man, I'm just going through this list of names. Lawson Oschenbach didn't know he was still racing with the Riley uh, and the Mercedes AMG GT3. I'm just going through some names. I'm like, I can't believe this person's still racing. Aaron Tielitz, I forgot. Yeah. he's He did the, uh, Vassar, the Vassar Sullivan. I think he's in that for the whole he season. Fifth? No, fourth. Further, further back. Way further back. No, fourth or fifth. I don't think so. Oh, I think you're right because there's GTLMs in between. But. No, they did. They were. He's racing the full season, right? Yeah, I think so. Okay. So that's cool. Richard Heistead. Yeah. Shout out to AT. Hopefully we can get him on the podcast too. You got that connection? Yeah, I'll hit, I'll hit him up and see. Tatiana Calderon raced. I think that's that all girls team. Uh, with, they did a Lamborghini. That they did No, they did a Lamborghini oh. this year. Um, as I just go through, Roman DeAngelis, Trent Estep. Those are two former Carters that uh, did the GT3, American GT3 Cup Series. Both didn't have the greatest of races. But uh, super cool that they were. You got a friend there. You got a little friend. Yeah. What are you gonna do? You scared of bees? It's just a friend. A friend. It's not gonna do anything with you. Okay. It's not gonna sting you. Don't be. Don't be scared. So, no, that's that's cool. So a lot of guys into it, but the actual uh, the the spectacle of the Daytona twenty four hours. Is awesome. I don't. Have you ever been there in I, person? I don't buy it in. I, I don't buy in at all. What? First of all, the track. Get to the track. Have you driven on the track? I drove on the sim. No, I hope uh, uh, that uh, it has uh, uh, any. Uh, 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 have you driven on the track? So you okay? Have you? Yes. Tell me. Thank you. Tell me. Change my mind. Okay. Is it change? Is my it mind. Watkins Glen? Is it Road America? Is it Spa? Is it Le Mans? No. But you have to respect the history. You have to respect the difficulty of the event. Um, is it the most difficult track to drive in the world? No. But so so be it. Is Monza the most difficult track in the world to drive? Different. No, it's not. It's but the th- history. It's the history and prestige. No. Yes, 100%. 
hundred percent. And you feel that is Daytona everybody. the hardest NASCAR track to drive on? I don't listen. I'm not. I'm not a NASCAR driver either. I've never done that level of NASCAR, but like, <laughs> I can't imagine that that is harder than Charlotte or Rockingham or some of the other tracks. Like, I get it's a different skill set, the draft, and like why wall trip, dude. It's a B. It's not gonna hurt you. <laughs> Chill out. Wow. He's out. TJ's out. Just sit back down. I can't. You can't. Well, the Rolex Twenty Four. Oh, yeah. The spectacle. Okay. I just think. Look. Uh, convince me otherwise about the track. You're t- you're telling me the history, the tradition. <sighs> look, it's no Sebring, but it's. Like I said, it's 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 not a necessarily about the track. It's about the event. That's not drawing fans in. I don't think that's drawing fans in, and I don't think that. Again, like I said, it's no Bathurst. It's not this. It's but not. That's what we want. But it's the history. Out of racing. What? And, and oh, look, so we're just look. When I get approached, when I get an email come across my stupid email address that has some the contents of it. Are telling me that the budget, literally in the entry of the email, never met this person before. <laughs> never love, met this person. I love person. these emails. And the budget to race in whatever GT program to bring it, it costs ninety thousand dollars. It's absurd. It's absurd. Go go like that is sick. That is disgusting. Yeah. It really is. It's I mean, absurd. that's disgusting. Anybody involved in that in the motorsport side, stop doing that. <laughs> Seriously, stop doing that. It's disgusting. It's literally gross. And it turns but, uh, me off for <laughs> all forms of racing. But there's but there are costs. I don't give a shit. There's costs to actually it's operating. It's such a slap pro- in the face as a driver that like a little bit of talent here, a little bit of talent there. Oh. Got some oh. experience, whatever. To to get that across your plate and like really hype you up, but then like in the same email mention the budget, which by the way is a very poor sales technique. If no, that's what you're it doing, it is actually a horrible t- sales technique. What I've always loved and hated at the same time, but loved because I'm like you're an idiot. You get on the rope for no is 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 the teams that are like, um, they'll kind of word it to like, oh, you know, um, we'd love to have you come race with us. We'd love. To you should think about, and and I know this from this past year with one of my drivers. We'd love to have X driver come test with us. We're really interested in them and being a part of our program. And then you're like, cool, let's talk about it. And they're like, okay, cool. So one day is uh, five thousand dollars, and you're just like, or more depending on the series, right? And you're like, did I, I'm not the one that em-, and I get sales, but I'm like, I'm not the one that emailed you. So you're giving you're coming at me is trying to sell me on full tilt boogie pricing, <laughs> like not even a small discount. Yeah, like let's like, talk. Let's talk. Let's talk about it. Yeah, like <laughs> like, like wait maybe, what? Maybe like put this over the phone. Like maybe not in writing yet. Right. I remember. I think we talked about this on a previous podcast. Actually, I know we did. Like the one like big big sponsor that that I had an opportunity with that was like legit real sponsor, yeah. right? And I was so dumb and young and was like, yeah, so the full budget for the year is X. <laughs> and they were like, thanks. Psych. And you're like, you got to, there's got to be a little bit of foreplay. Work it. Work it. Massage. Get a little, a, little shoulder a rub. Just give a little, just give a little shoulder rub. Let them feel the vibrations of the cars. Yes. You know, that's what it takes. It does. It does. It's a long-term sale. It is. It's a lot of money. And I, you know, like I said before, my dad, has been in sales all his life and he's helped me out immensely with this and understanding, especially in, in business and in away from racing that I'm involved in. He'll tell me some of these big deals and he, you know, he's done deals with some of the biggest, largest companies there are in the world. And he'll say, there's some deals that literally take over a year yeah. from the first initial point of contact. And you're like, wait, what? Like even, and you're like, no, they'll say they're in and it will still take almost a year for the deal to actually be complete. Yeah. And that means deal signed and in implementation of whatever that deal is, sure. right? Whether or not it's a software, whether or not it's a product, whether or not it's a service, like that implementation to actually really get it going could sometimes take a year after the contract is signed. And you're like, that is crazy. And you hear about some of these deals in motorsports and it is, it is those deals that take 
a long time. You got to massage it. It's you got to work though. it. It's, it's hard. hard because it's we are, especially nowadays with social media, we are instant gratification. We are a culture of that. But also, man, we got to slow down. Four is happening, you know. And then this race, you got Bathurst, and then you know, IndyCar at St. Pete, and like, there's so many different races happening. And you feel like you're out of it. You feel like you're dead I, and gone. We are out of it. We are out of it. I'm out of it. I'm out of it. I drove a race car for like I a proper be... race car for the first time in a while recently. What did you drive? You sent me pictures. Yeah. I, barfed, um, I vomited. Well, it wasn't like anything. I mean, okay. I'm going to sound like I'm jaded, but um, the GT4 Cayman, yeah. uh, it was surprising how rusty I was in certain areas. <laughs> really? Uh, and it was all in braking. Very rusty, I would say. I thought I got back to it quickly, but I meant like for the, I, to be in the car right away and like, I felt comfortable in the car yeah. because obviously I drive Porsches quite a bit. So like sure. that feeling was pretty much there, but the braking and having like proper brake racing brake system sure. back on a car was like my brain was so used to boosted power assisted mm. brakes yeah, right. that I would my initial pressure was horrible. Horrible. Podunk. Podunk. It was bad. Tug braking. It took me I was doing short stints, but it took me two solid sessions to get the pressure where it needed to be. And I was really surprised on that. <laughs> Cause even looking after looking at the data after the first session, I was like, oh wow. I'm like really i was like i'm really low on pressure so i thought second session i'd be like cool done yeah. got it like yeah. still think i'm pretty crisp on being able to make those adjustments but i was still a, a good a 30 percent under where well, i needed to be i got it but then the tires were off and not to make excuses but yeah, the, the tires know. were run off at that point so i didn't really wasn't able to go much faster but then there were certain areas of of the track that I was like ooh. Still got it. There's a lot of time there. No, I was like, I still got it. Oh, oh, no. There's like, definitely huh. certain parts I felt very comfortable. I was oh, like, you yeah. felt saucy. Yeah, I felt saucy. Yeah, like, like I, I was out like, there. okay, I'd like to see someone else do that. No, not that. <laughs> <laughs> not that confident anymore. But um, no, I, it was it was good to get back out there because the uh, the guy was helping coach, who's very talented driver in his own right, but he doesn't have much car experience. Mm. Um, and has a lot of experience at that track and, and in those cars was a little bit quicker than me. But in areas of the track, I was quite a bit quicker than him. In areas, he was quite a bit quicker. Quite That's because we've, we're a little bit deep now. But, uh, you know, there was, there was a little bit of, oh, and it was good. It was cool because I, I respect him a lot as a driver. Yeah. Um, that there were areas where he, I was like, oh, wow, okay about this, the way to drive this car because you have experience in this car sure. and, and braking and where I was lacking and then where he was lacking, I was able to help provide that with them um, was fun. It, it was good because, you know, doing a lot of the coaching stuff, you don't tend to drive as much unless you're still a driver, right? Mm. So though you understand some, you do kind of realize, oh, I can apply it, but ooh, I'm a little rusty here. Yeah, I'm a yeah. little... Applying it, I know it. I know, I know, I know what the brake trace is supposed to look yeah. like, right? I know what the initial pressure, but my foot and my brain yeah. aren't connected with what 2,000, 1,800 pounds of pressure in this car feels <laughs> right, like, right. right? Muscle memory. Yeah. So that was interesting. It was fun. It was good to get back out there. And uh, I'm not going to lie, it sparked. Really? Got me a little, <laughs> a little saucy. Well, I'm ready. There's an off road racing program I know about. It's getting kind of in the works here. I'm scared. I can't. I don't think I can do it. I think you just two years ago I would have said yes. I think you just need to go testing and man, I don't yourself. know with with the with the kid. Not about the risky stuff anymore. It's not risky. I'm gonna go stick to my go kart races and my driving slow GT cars. It's not that risky. It's not. What do you see risky about it? I don't know. Someone dying every year in one of those things. Yeah, it seems but, like, but it's not like. Same like, reason I jump, don't jump out of airplanes. It's not the program. Or fly in helicopters. It's not, It's like different programs. Yeah. I think like there's a there's a type, yeah. but not going there. I think that it's everything you want out of driving. 
That I agree with. I've always thought it was really cool. I got some friends that do it. I, lo- I, I love watching it. It's really fun. Uh, I'd be down to do like one of the sprint races, like the like the series that they have where they do like the tracks, not like the outdoor get mm-hmm. lost in the woods. That's the, Jensen that, Button lost for everything. 17 hours. That's so great. I, you know what? I was literally three miles away from where Jensen was, lost, stuck, broken down. Why weren't you guys on the sat phone together? Can't. Can't. Uh-huh. Too many mountains. That's crazy. Yeah. Couldn't That's even crazy. get in contact with our team on a sat phone. That's crazy. Yeah. It was a cheap sat phone. So uh, a lot of lessons were learned, <laughs> and there's a story there that we'll go into in a later time. Episode two, and listening to uh, episode two of season two of Cafe Machina. We'll be back hopefully uh, next week. I'm still in town. TJ's still in town. 